Welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining in. Much appreciated. And hey, Bill, just so you know, you're still on camera, so wave. <laughs> um, the slides are in the ACM webcast content channel. So there's that channel we're having the chat in. Go one channel below that. You'll be able to download a PDF version of the slides. That'll get you off into the races. You, you know, you can play along and play the home game type of thing. Uh, quick thank you shout out to all of our sister companies. Uh, this would not happen without everybody's involvement. So, uh, you know, that is greatly appreciated. I mentioned you're going to need a copy of the class VM. So you only, as Bill said, you only need to download one of these virtual box, generic over or the VM where workstation, um, personal preference is virtual box. Uh, just because the, this VM seems to run with like half as much RAM and fewer and half as many processors as when I try to run it on VMware. But, you know, pick your poison, go with what you want. If you haven't downloaded yet, I would highly, highly, highly recommend that you go through and start it now because it is a fairly large download. It's like 12, 13 gigs, somewhere in that range there. To access that system, you got two choices. One is you can just access it through the VM itself. So you can do all of the labs right through the virtual interface that you get on your VM. So you can do everything right through here if you want to. If you don't, if you want to do remote access, how to do remote access depends upon the, uh, the virtual software you're using. VMware, you can access the VM from your host system based on IP address. This was the IP address I said at the time. So if you use this link, that should get you into AC Hunter Community Edition. If you're on VirtualBox, you need to go through and you need to set up uh, the loopback interface. And we actually have a blog on that. <clears throat> Because, you know, we have a blog on just about everything now. There we go. Port forwarding with VirtualBox. And I will send that into the Discord channel in case people need it. But that'll tell you how to go through and set up port forwarding on VirtualBox. Cool. Login information. So to get in and get terminal access. So if you're SSHing into the box or something like that, login name threat password is hunting. If you run the VM, uh, I, I think I set both of them up to automatically log into the desktop. Actually, I take that back. I don't think virtual um, VMware gave me that option. So you may have to log into VMware through the uh, terminal this way. But <clears throat> notice there's a slight difference in the login when you get to the web browser. So when you're logging into AC Hunter Community Edition, this is the login name to use because it has the login has to be in an email format. And this is the password to use because the password of just hunting was one character shy of what it would allow me to put in there. Help me fix an oops. So yeah, do me a quick favor. When you download and you get everything up and running and you get into active countermeasure, or when you get into AC Hunter, go to the little gear icon up here on the right where it says settings. Doesn't matter what database you're in, go to safe lists and then come down here and click delete all. And what that's gonna do is remove all of the safe list entries that are in there. I meant to clean those up before um, I packaged up the VMs. I don't think I did that on every platform. So if you could do that for me, it would be greatly appreciated. <clears throat> uh, some cool stuff to check out. Oh, I gotta show you this. <clears throat> so, um, hmm. There's going to be a zine coming out. So if you're not familiar with the zine, this is what they look like. This is the prompt zine. Uh, these are really cool. Uh, there's like little games you can play inside of these. Uh, there's comics that show up inside of these. And there's one coming out in April that's going to be threat hunting based. Uh, so that's going to be really cool. Uh, one of the things that's going to be in that zine is uh, a threat hunting capture the flag. And we're going to do some cool things with that. There's going to be, um, we're going to do it in cohorts. So like April, there'll be a group, uh, May, there'll be a group, June, and so on. I think we're going to run it out to like August, September, or something like that. And for the top three people that finish and get the highest score, uh, there will be prizes. <laughs> there will be geeky type prizes. But there'll be one special prize once the magazine comes out. 
for the first person to get all the way through and get everything right. Uh, for that person, you'll get, and I think you can see this, a threat hunting coin. Ooh, very rare, only a few of these. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that'll be coming out in April. Um, uh, if uh, Deborah, Jason, if you guys are still around, if you could share a link. Oh, actually, I get it on the bottom. Never mind. So the bottom here. If you want to make sure you get for notified as soon as prop comes out, this first link down the bottom. Go ahead and hit that. Sign up. They don't spam you, but they'll let you know when uh, the next uh, issue of prompt is available. Uh, you definitely want to go in and check that out. And besides Charm is coming up in April, I'll be out there teaching the advanced threat hunting course. So if you like this and you want to take it a step further, that may be an option. Uh, you can attend live or you can also do it online, whatever, make, whatever floats your boat. So for those of you who've been here before, um, this is going to be kind of a little bit of a refresh. I shortened a lot of the stuff in the beginning because just because I feel like I don't have to justify why you need to threat hunt as much as we used to, uh, most people kind of get it now. So I've pulled a lot of that stuff out. And I wanted to add more into the lab time. So we went through and did that. And using AC Hunter Community Edition is new because we just released that a couple of weeks ago. Um, I've never wanted to do this around the commercial version because it's kind of like, hey, you're using this, you're learning how to use a tool that you have to pay for. And I just, that's just, I don't know, not cool with that. Uh, but AC Hunter Community Edition, freely available, that opens it up for to be able to go through and teach with that. So I'm kind of excited about that. As far as logistics go, uh, we'll take a 10 minute break at the top of each hour. Um, we'll, you know, there'll be folks available for Q&A in case there are any questions. Um, halfway through the class, we'll go through and we'll do a 20 minute break. Now, some of what we're going to be doing is going to be at the command line on a Linux system. That's not like the comfort zone for a lot of folks. And one of the things that we're going to be doing is working with nested commands. So nested commands means I'm not just going to run a command and look at the output. I'm going to run a command and then take that output and run it through some other process. And then I might even take that output and run it through another process and so on and so on. It can be a little hard to follow sometimes. I will go through and explain it. But sometimes, you know, you hear it, it makes sense, and then you come back to it a week later and it's like, I just don't get it. Uh, this is a really cool site that's been recommended by a couple of folks who've attended previous training, where you can take that command, copy, paste it into that website, and it will break down each command and tell you exactly what's going on, including all the command line switches, which I think is pretty awesome. Uh, the other thing you can do is just do one command at a time. So if I've nested five commands together, run the first command. What's the output look like? Okay, now run it through the second command. You know, the first and the second command combined. How does that change the output? What if you add in the third? You know, that for me, seeing it in kind of logical order like that sometimes help me, helps me process it a little bit easier. Uh, someone asked, are the databases that come with the community edition the same as the Class Lab VM data sets? No. Um, if you download the VM of the community edition, there's actually a couple of additional databases in there. I nuked those in this class for two reasons. Uh, one, we're not going to use them in the class. <laughs> Uh, and two, I wanted to save as much drive space as I possibly could to make this download as small as possible. So if you get the community edition, you know, without the class content, there will be some additional databases in there. All right. So sanity check. We're talking about, we're going to talk about threat hunting. And threat hunting is that, act, that uh, active pursuit of infiltrators to our network. You know, in other words, our protections have failed, the bad guys got in, and we're going to go try and hunt them down. Are we getting better at finding them, yes or no? Because I see a lot of mixed data out there. My personal opinion is maybe a little bit, but not much. It seems like attackers are still living on the network for about six months before they get caught. And typically, they're getting caught by an outside third party. They're not getting caught by the organization that actually got compromised. 
we are seeing some studies say, hey, we're getting better at it. You know, dwell time to a detection is, is down to, you know, a couple of weeks and that's it. We're doing much better now. Every one of those studies I've looked at includes ransomware and it includes ransomware announcing itself as part of the detection of, of dwell time. So let me give you now an, uh, an example, right? So imagine you come home one day and all your electronics are gone. Someone's broken into your house and they've stolen everything. The following morning, somebody comes to your front door, knocks on it and says, hi, I was the one who stole all your stuff. Are you going to praise the local police for solving break-ins in less than 24 hours now? Of course not. Police had nothing to do with it, right? The, the person who stole stuff showed up at your door and said, hi, yeah, I just did bad things to you. The police had nothing to do with that. I look at this the same way. If ransomware pops its head up after a week and says, hi, I'm here and I just encrypted all your drives, you can't say, woo, look at us. We detected that in a week instead of six months. Yay for us. No, no, it's too late. It doesn't count. And the studies I see that say we're getting better all include that as part of the metrics. One of the really telling things for me is that when you look at how much does it cost to recover, how much effort is involved, those numbers haven't moved an inch. If anything, they've gotten a little bit worse. Now think about that. If it used to take us six months to detect, but now it's taking two weeks, wouldn't you expect that to cost less? Wouldn't you expect that to take less effort? Yeah, that's only logical, right? And yet that's not the case. So looking at those secondary numbers, that tells me, yeah, we still have a ways to go with this whole thing. So what's the purpose of threat hunting? You know, does this replace something we're already doing? That's one of the big questions I get a lot. What can I stop doing because I'm doing threat hunting? And the answer, unfortunately, is it doesn't replace anything. This is something we really should have been doing all along. We just didn't have the technology to be able to go through and deal with it properly. When you look at, you know, all, when you look at our security tools, our cybersecurity tools, they fall into one of two buckets. They're either the stuff to keep the bad people out or the stuff we do once they, we know they're there. The hole is between those, tying them together. How do we figure out our protections have failed and we need to go into incident response mode? That's the goal of threat hunting, is to figure out, hey, yeah, we put all these walls up to keep the bad people out, but they still got in anyway. Now we need to trigger incident response mode. That's its main goal in life. So where do you start? I see a lot of people starting with their SIM. And it kind of makes sense because we've been focused on the SIM for years, right? <clears throat> the vendors push it hard, you know, go through your logs. Here's my problem. The SIM never, ever, ever shows you everything. I've never, ever, ever been in an environment where the SIM actually has logs from everything. There's always stuff missing. And sometimes that stuff that's missing is the stuff that gets broken into. I've seen IoT and IoT devices get compromised and being used as an attack platform to go after the rest of the environment. Those typically don't log. And if they do, they're not gonna generate a log that's going to give you an identifiable enough signature to figure out that thing has been broken into. So by looking at centralized logs, it sounds good, but when you, it, it, and anybody who's done this knows, right? The concept of centralized logging sounds great right up until you get into implementation and you realize there's a bunch of stuff missing. And even if it isn't missing, everything logs things differently. I can't look for a buffer overflow on a Windows box the same way as a Linux box, the same way as a Cisco router versus, you know, some sort of, you know, temperature monitoring device. They're all going to log things slightly differently. So starting with the host, to me, uh, the host logs to me doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The network, however, gives you full visibility. You know, attackers may be able to hide their process on the system, but they can't hide their packets. They can try and obfuscate them. They can try and blend in with the regular traffic patterns. But if you know what to look for, those packets is still there. And it doesn't matter if it's Linux, Windows, a Cisco router, or some type of IoT device. It's all IP. IP is IP. Everybody has their little nuances in how they communicate, but at the end of the day, IP is IP. So if I go looking for that, that's going to give me a real heads up on what's going on in my network. And what I like to talk go after is command and control. 
because that's consistent. You know, command and control works by the compromise system talking to something out on the internet that allows the attacker to proxy through that and thus take control of your internal system. It may look different in different situations, right? That might use HTTP or HTTPS or DNS, but there are some behavioral characteristics to it that we can target in on that will allow us to find it regardless of whether it's something we've seen before. I see many folks relying way too hard on signatures. Signatures are great when I want to detect something I already know about. But if I'm worried about bleeding edge, if I'm worrying about the cutting edge stuff, signatures fall apart and don't do me any good. And I'll give you a great example, Sunburst. I'm sure we all remember that from a couple of years ago, right? There were literally tens of thousands of environments that got compromised. But Rita, AC Hunter, tag those as soon as the, uh, as soon as the folks that were running it updated their SolarWinds server with, that, with the code that had the malicious hooks in it. Why? Because the first thing it tried to do was set up a commit. Well, it didn't right away, but it tried to set up a command and control channel. And as soon as it did that, bang, they were able to go in and grab it. Even though Sunburst had never appeared before, we didn't have any signatures yet because it started rolling out in about July or August. It wasn't until December that FireEye told us about it and pushed out enough content that vendors could write, start writing signatures. But hey, that's still August to December that a lot of people were vulnerable. But if you go after it from a behavioral characteristic standpoint, you tag this thing, no problem. So that's a lot of what we're going to go through and talk through. So when we talk about threat hunting, what is our process order, right? If we look at it like from like a 30,000 foot view, what does threat hunting look like? For me, the first thing I always want to do is try and identify connection persistency. What does that mean? If I, that means you have an internal system that is constantly communicating with some entity out on the internet. It might be once per minute. It might be once per hour but there's some regular basis to its communication. It's not opportunistic, right? Think about how you use Google, right? You might use Google four or five or 10 times a day, but you know it's gonna be at different time intervals and some days you won't use it at all. That's opportunistic. What uh, we're looking for is persistent. We're looking for there's some regular time interval to when this is taking place. So the first thing I go looking for is connection persistency. When I find it, the next thing I want to identify is business need. Is there a reason that my system is talking to that host? Because there might be a legitimate reason for that. If you're running Windows systems, <clears throat> they're going to call out back to windows.com and look for patches on a regular basis, right? That's a business need. Hey, I need to patch my system. I need to keep it up to date. If I'm running a Linux system, it's probably going to reach out on a regular basis to some system host within ntp.org to check to see what time it is so it can sync its time clock. Again, there's a business need for that. You know, The ones I'm gonna worry about is when I can't identify a business need. That's when I'm gonna go in and start doing a little bit of a deeper dive. What is this external entity that they're talking to? Is there anything abnormal about the protocol that's being used? If I still can't get answers to all my questions, now I may go look at my SIM and start jumping into host logs to figure out what's going on from there. The goal of threat hunting is one of two dispositions. For every system connected to my network, every single IP address, not just the desktops, not just the servers, we're talking IoT devices, hard network hardware, everything. For every device on the network, am I pretty certain it's still in pristine condition or am I pretty certain it's compromised and we're going to have a bad day, possibly a bad week, maybe even a bad month, right? Those are making A or B right? Zero or one. It's pretty, it, it's pretty binary, our choices. That's the goal of a threat hunter. So start with the network. So here's a good example, right? So we're using the uh, community edition screen here. I've got my internal system. It's talking to some IP address out on the internet. There's an awful lot of really useful data here, like this graph on the bottom. My x-axis is time. Each one of these bars represents a one-hour period of time. My y-axis is quantity. It's, it's describing how many times did my internal system create a T, an IP connection to this host out on the internet. We can see here it was about 120 times. Okay, 120 times in an hour, that means it's going off about every 30 seconds, right? 
Notice I drew a red line in. This isn't part of the tool. The red lines here are stuff that I uh, annotated this uh, screen capture with. But notice everything pretty much lines up with the red line. There's some stuff above and some stuff below. But anytime you can draw a flat line across a large section of time like that, that's indicative of it being a persistent connection. If I've got a persistent connection, I should be able to identify a business need with it. This screen here, when I'm in view, to view one mode, is basically the same information as down here. It's just displayed differently. Here we're looking at how many connections are taking place each hour. Here what we're looking at is how many times did we see a specific time delta between connections. When we were looking down here, I said, yeah, it's going off about every 30 seconds. What this is telling me is, well, no, it's going off about every 28 or 29 seconds. Sometimes it goes off at 30 seconds. Sometimes it goes off at 27, but primarily it's 28 or 29. This is what's referred to as jitter. Jitter is just simply rather than going off exactly at the 30 second time interval every time, it's varying the time slightly. Why is it doing that? It's doing that because most network threat hunting uh, tools rely on an algorithm called k-means clustering to identify beacons. That's k-m-e-a-n-s space clustering. In case you want to look it up, Wiki's got some good information on it. But all k-means is, is it's a math algorithm that looks for repetitive patterns in large data sets. So imagine we had a million connections go out to the internet yesterday, but buried in there was one system talking to one out on the internet exactly every 30 seconds all day long. Well, k-means will look at that and say, that's persistency. You need to go pay attention to that. And that threat hunting tool would point it out to you. As soon as you start jittering it like this, k-means looks at that and says, no, 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 that's not a beacon because it's not exactly 30 seconds every time. The timing is varying. It's not a repetitive pattern. I will ignore that. If you're using, so question number one, if you're looking at network-based threat hunting tool, what are you using to detect beacons? If they say k-means clustering, just run away. It's not even worth it. Just run away. Because when things jitter, and oh, by the way, every, uh, Every hunt I've been part of for at least the last two, probably three years, where we've detected red teamers, where we've detected hostile entities, every single one of them has used jitter, which means k-means is pretty much useless these days. If they can't detect it with k-means, what they do is they just fall back on writing signatures. Well, that means we're back to detecting what we already know about again. We can't detect new things. No, that doesn't help, right? We need to be safe from the new stuff too. Um, I have this labeled as cobalt strike. Yeah, if you've ever used cobalt strike, cobalt strike has something called the B sleep function. And with the B sleep function, I can go in and say, beacon every 30 seconds, plus or minus 10%. You know, and that means it'll be, sometimes it'll be as short as 27 seconds, sometimes as long as 33 seconds. And you end up, because the B sleep function isn't that random, you always end up with a bell curve. You always end up with something like this. So anytime I look at this screen and I see this, my first thought is, yep, that looks like it's uh, somebody running Cobalt Strike. Notice we've got some additional information here too. I can see it's going to DigitalOcean. See this section here where it says query fully qualified domain name and historic fully qualified domain name. What we're doing is we're going back to the DNS queries that took place on the network to see what was looked up that returned this IP address. Think about how most people browse the web, right? You type something into your browser, www.google.com or whatever. DNS goes and resolves that out to an IP address and then your system connects to that IP address. So for a regular user, I would expect to see something here describing what they were trying to access. That can be super helpful, right? Because if I'm looking at something like this and it's going to windows.com and it's got a valid digital certificate, it's probably okay. But if it's going to, you know, sorry, I'm evil, dot RU, yeah, I'm going to worry about that one, right? There's probably not a business need associated with that. Here, though, we can see there was no DNS lookup. Oh, that makes me nervous because IT people do that on occasion, maybe security people, but most people don't access websites based on the IP address. So that's going to make me a little bit more nervous. And I'll get more into what we can do with this information up here as we go through. But the point here is, yeah, we got connection persistency. 
once identifying connection persistency, now it makes sense to maybe go take a look at my host logs. And you can actually do that. We won't get into this in this class uh, just because it, it kind of uh, would take up too much time. I think I need to do another class to kind of add on to this one. But let's say I identify, let's say when I install uh, AC Hunter Community Edition, when I install that, one of the things it's going to ask me is, do you want to install Beaker? Beaker is our open source project that leverages Sysmon on Windows systems to collect what's referred to as ID3 events. ID3s are applications talking on the network. And if you think about it, that's kind of the bare minimum I need to keep track of. I could track every process change, every register key change, every permission change, and you know, and all that stuff you see a lot of a lot of applications doing. The problem with that is I end up putting a lot of additional load on that endpoint, right? I, in fact, I may end up putting so much additional load just because of the information I'm trying to collect that I probably could have saved three to five hundred dollars by buying the next model down, right? We may end up chewing up that much CPU time and that much RAM. We're also going to end up saturating the network with all these log entries that get transmitted. For a SIM, we're going to fill it up with a lot of stuff that we'll probably never even look at, which means the database will run slower. The queries are going to run slower. You get it. We, we tend to kind of err on the when in doubt, collect everything side. And I get it because it's safer. But if we stop and really think about what do I need just to identify whether we need to go into uh, incident response mode or not, it's apps talking on the network. Because if somebody breaks into that box, it's going to be over the network. If that box calls out to a command and control server, it's going to be over the network. If somebody tries to move laterally, it's going to be, you guessed it, over the network. So if I watch the apps talking on the network, that's kind of my minimal use case to be able to really be able to identify what's going on with that system without collecting so much data that it kills the performance of the system and my database and all that other fun stuff. So one of the cool things you can do with Windows CE, or excuse me, with, um, with AC Hunter CE and Beaker is you can link them together. You'll get this little Beaker icon here if you're running both. And now when I see something like this, I can click the little beaker icon to say what application was running on this system that connected to that IP address over that date time frame. And I'll get a screen kind of similar to this, where it'll tell me, oh, hey, this was the executable that was responsible for that connection. Oh, runtime broker. Oh, yeah, runtime broker is okay. That goes through and checks permissions to make sure that, you know, my apps aren't trying to invade my privacy. But wait a minute. Runtime broker shouldn't be talking to the DigitalOcean environment. That makes no sense at all. Maybe this is not the runtime broker I think it is. Notice what happened here. If all we did was go through our SIM and we saw somebody was running runtime broker, we probably wouldn't give it a second thought, right? Because it's a legitimate app. Yet in this context, it's causing our system to talk to an IP address that is not part of the Microsoft domain, that makes no sense at all. With that context to work with, we know we need to worry about this binary. We need to go in an instant response mode at this point. Don't cross the passive active line. What do I mean by that? It's very easy to conflate threat hunting into incident response. By that, I mean, if you're in security, you've probably got at least a little bit of OCD going. I know I do. I have a, more than just a little bit. So we tend to kind of, once we pull a thread, we got to keep pulling on it. Now, here's the problem. It's real easy to shoot yourself in the foot when you go through and do that. And I'll give you a perfect example. I was involved with an environment where they went through, they were doing a hunt, they found a system that was compromised, and their first thought was isolate that box kind of makes sense, right? Hey, that system looks like it's been compromised. Let's isolate it and get it off of the network. Well, turns out it wasn't just that box that was isolated, that was compromised. It was about 12 other boxes that were compromised too. And when they isolated the first one that had a very low frequency for the command and control channel, the attackers figured out, oh no, they're onto us. And then they came in through the other systems they had compromised and started going scorched earth on the environment. Ouch, I hate it when that happens. So had a proper incident response taken place, one of the things that would have I've been identified is, okay, before we start doing anything, we need to identify scope. Is this the only box compromised, yes or no? 
And now they may have pulled back and said, hey, that system that looks like it's acting as a command and control server that this one is talking to, is anybody else talking to that IP address? If they had just done that one check, they would have caught this, like a dozen other systems compromised as well. Now scope went from being one system to 12. Now I know, okay, I don't wanna do anything to that first system until I'm ready to do it to all of them at the same time so that I'm not tipping off the attacker, I'm off to them, I'm just ripping out their access, you know, root and stem all at the same time. So this don't cross the passive active line, don't do anything the attacker can detect. Now there are some gray areas here. For example, one of the things I'll do on occasion is if I see a system talking to somebody out on the internet and I don't recognize the domain and I don't know what it is, I'll spin up a virtual desktop over in Amazon and then go access the website from that. Well, wait, Chris, you're, you're actively going to the website. Aren't they going to detect that? Yeah, they will. But you know what? <laughs> there is no website on the internet, even ones that have never, ever been advertised that aren't getting hit hundreds of times a day. People are constantly out there scanning for websites. So if I come at it from like easy, you know, the, the, the Amazon environment, then it's not clear to them that, uh, that uh, I'm on to them. They just see somebody connected to their website and they probably got 50 or another 100 connections that are logged in there as well. So there's an example of, okay, I'm actively probing them in a way. I'm going to their website, but I'm not going to do it from anything that can be tied back to my specific environment. So keep it passive. And if you get to a point where next step has to be active, make sure you're in incident response mode. You're far less likely to have things get missed. All right, let's talk about some detection techniques. So we're talking about analyzing network traffic to look for command and control. How much data do we need? Let's start with that. Because most threat hunting tools work with about 20 minutes worth of data, and that's it. Well, wait a minute, we were talking about Sunburst earlier, right? Sunburst was beaconing every 15 minutes plus or minus a minute and a half. So the delta time might be as short as 13 and a half seconds. It might be as long as 16 and a half seconds. If I've only got 20 minutes of data, how many connections am I going to see? Probably one, right? If I'm lucky, I might see two. Is two connections enough to figure out this connection persistency? No, no, it's not. What about an hour? Well, if I do an hour, I've got four connections. Is that enough to figure it out? Eh, maybe but I'm going to have a ton of false positives in there too. What if it's two hours, four hours, 12 hours, 24 hours? If I have 24 hours worth of data, sunburst is going off almost 100 times. That's plenty to be able to go through and figure out connection persistency, right? So this is kind of a balancing act. For me, my goal is 24 hours worth of data. I like to go through data in 24-hour blocks you might only be able to do 12, you know, depending upon what your storage requirements are and how much bandwidth you have and everything else. Um, and if you um, have .mil in your domain name, you may want to do two days worth of data or three days worth of data chunks because you're a very, very high value target. So this number is generic. By that, I mean for the average environment, 24 hours is a good number to go to, but you may need to go a little less. You may need to go a little lo longer. Just keep in mind that if you go less, your hunts are going to be harder. You're going to get more things. You're going to have more things fly into the radar. You're going to have more things that you catch that really don't mean anything. If you keep collect more data, let's say five days worth, your hunts are going to be more accurate, but it's going to take longer to process those data in five-day chunks. And analyze connections and pairs. And pairs can mean a couple of different things. I'll get into that as we go through. So typical deployment, where do I want to monitor things? Now, this is going to vary for, you know, from environment to environment. Everybody's a little bit unique. But for the most part, where I want to monitor my traffic is internal interface of the firewall. Because I'm going to see things pre-NAT, which means I'm going to see the private address that was actually assigned to the system. And it's going to be easier for me to figure out who's who. If I'm monitoring outside the firewall, now everything's already been NATed. 
Now, yeah, I can go to my firewall and I can probably look at what was the upper port number and which, you know, internal system did that map, map to. So it's not like the end of the world if I do this outside my firewall. It's just going to add an additional step anytime I want to go in and run things down. But if I just monitor inside the firewall, that problem goes away. Um, here, what you see is I have my firewall. I have a switch. I have Zeke plugged into a mirror port, copy port, span port, whatever your vendor calls it. Zeke is plugged into a port that is copying everything going in and out of the internal interface of the firewall. So typically I'll go in and say span port 24 to port three. Port three is where the firewall's internal interface is plugged in. And now all the traffic going in and out of port three gets copied over to port 24 as well. And now I can go in and see that. If I don't have a managed switch, or, you know, if I'm pushing a lot of bandwidth, I can always go with a network tap. You know, a network tap will just simply plug into the cable section and it'll pull the packets off at that point there. Notice my Zeke system has two interfaces to it, one to monitor traffic and the other one for remote access to this box. So when I SSH into the box, it'll be through here. When I take those Zeke logs and copy them off someplace else to be able to work with them, it'll be through this interface of the Zeke system. And then I've got AC Hunter plugged in here. So we'll take the Zeke logs off of this system once per hour, copy them over to the AC Hunter box. We'll do that probably use an SSH because that's nice and secure. We can use public private keys. So it becomes inter, uh, non-interactive at that point there. And now I've got all my logs over here to be able to go through and work with them. Do we get blind spots working with C2? If we're going in trying to find, you know, is somebody running command and control? Yes or no? Yeah, it's possible. We have seen malware that doesn't use C2 channels. Here's the problem. It gets out of hand. Not pet ear is a great example. Not pet ear was the Russians yet again targeting Ukraine. And they targeted Ukraine by deciding, hey, you know what we'll do? Everybody who does business in Ukraine needs to pay taxes, obviously. And there's this system that most um, overwhelming majority of businesses use to figure out what their tax burdens are. So we'll compromise that system. That'll allow us to push our malware out to everybody doing business in Ukraine. And now we'll go in, we'll, uh, once we land on that system, we'll try and move laterally using some internal vulnerabilities. And then once we've uh, grabbed all those boxes, we'll encrypt the drives. And we'll pop up a screen that says, hey, pay us money or, you know, you never get your data back. But even if they pay us money, we're never going to get you. You're never going to get your data back. So not pet. It was basically the cyber equivalent of a bomb, right? It goes in, blows up every system it touches. And of course, the problem with not pet you was that it wasn't limited to just Ukraine. This went global. You know, some of you may remember um you know, the, the major shipping ports like in LA and, and in New Jersey, where there were literally miles of 18 wheelers because they couldn't load stuff onto the boats and they couldn't unload the boats because the software they needed to use to figure out how to do that without making the boat tip over was all locked away because of not pet yet. Um, there were many systems in Russia <laughs> that got compromised and wiped out as well. So this idea of creating malware that you can't ever call back or talk to, bad, bad idea. It always gets out of hand. This is, you know, this has always been a problem with self-propagating worms. So you tend to not see them. However, if, if you get hit with a self-propagating worm that doesn't use a C2 channel, yeah, you're right. You're not going to catch that as part of this threat hunt. So it's, it's an edge case, but we certainly want to keep an eye on things just to make sure that we don't run into that either. So start by checking persistency. Uh, let's see, see a question. So Zeke and Rita are requirements for to use AC Hunter, sort of. Rita is actually built in AC Hunter. We use Rita in the back end. And in fact, we'll be using Rita commands to import some of our data. So you don't need to worry about getting Rita on the box, install AC Hunter, and that'll take care of it. Uh, with Zeke, Zeke, uh, Rita, uh, excuse me, uh, AC, ACH will actually install Rita for you. So when you run the binary to install AC Hunter, it'll say, do you want to install AC Hunter? Yes, I do. Where do you want to install it? At what IP address? What account do you want me to use to log in? Then it'll ask you, do you want to do install Zeek? 
And you can say yes, and it'll say, okay, what IP using what account? And it will take care of the install for you. Same thing with Beaker and SB and a couple of other open source tools. So start by checking for persistency. So what does persistency look like? Well, persistency can be a beacon like we were starting to talk about, and I'm gonna describe in more detail as we go through, or it could be long connections, which we'll also talk about as well. But anytime we find some form of persistency, the next goal is, can I identify a business need for that? And it's not always clear cut. I'll give you a great example, TeamViewer. Is TeamViewer good or evil? Well, it depends, right? I was on a hunt a couple of years ago. Uh, that was one, it was a um, medical facility. That was one of the questions we asked was, are you running TeamViewer? And they said, yes, we have TeamViewer running on these two servers. And when we did our threat hunt, we found TeamViewer running on like 14 different systems. <laughs> well, in two cases, TeamViewer good, right? They, the environment knew it was there. They were using it. It was acceptable. There was a business need. Two cases, team viewer good. The other 12, team viewer bad. They didn't know it was on those boxes. They weren't taking control of it. And in fact, in one case, if I remember correctly, the team viewer was really bad because they had hired this, uh, this uh, IT company to manage some sort of specialized database they were running at the hospital. And they, from what I understand, they were incompetent idiots. So they fired them fairly quickly and then tried getting their money back and then tried to sue them to get their money back. They were that bad. Well, when we did our hunt, guess what team viewer was still running on? The jump box they were using to get access to that environment. So here, here was a consulting company that could be considered hostile because they were suing them. And they still had remote access into their environment because TeamViewer was running. So 14 cases of TeamViewer all in the same environment. Two cases good, you know, 11 cases bad, one case really, really bad. Context matters. So long connections, let's start off talking about that. So with a long connection, my compromised system calls out to a command and control server and just leaves that connection open and running all the time, 24 hours a day. Now, there's a little Achilles heel with Zeke. Zeke is an awesome tool. Uh, I used to be a PCAP guy. I am very much a Zeke guy now. And a lot of the reason for that is most of the stuff I care about uh, that I want to look at in a packet is there by default in Zeke. And if there's something missing that I want to see that doesn't show up, I can you know easily go in and write a module to go in and record that type of information as well. The other thing I like about Zeke is that it takes up about 1 the storage of PCAPs. So imagine I have enough disk space to store five days worth of PCAPs. Well, five days isn't much. So if I figure out a box has been whacked, I better hope it was just over the last two or three days, or I'm not going to have the history I need to really figure out what's going on. Well, in that same amount of storage that'll store five days worth of PCAPs, I can store 100 days of Zeek logs. Oh, that's a whole lot better visibility, right? <laughs> So Zeek, like I said, one of my favorite tools, but it does have a couple of things with it that I'm just not thrilled about. One of which is it doesn't write a log entry until the connection closes. Until Zeek considers that connection done, it doesn't write out a log entry. So think of this scenario for a second. I send a malicious email to your user, they click something they shouldn't have, I'm able to get malware on your system, and I call out to a command and control server and I don't beacon, I just leave that connection open all the time. Zeke will not log anything initially. Let's say I'm coming down that C2 channel, I'm running around your environment, I've been doing it for three months, I've been doing it for 90 days, and I've stolen everything I wanted to steal, and now I'm done and I'm cleaning my stuff up as I back out of your environment. And after 90 days, I kill that C2 connection. Now you will get a log entry from Zeke that says, hey, you were connecting this host out on the internet and we're doing it for 90 days. And you're like, whoa, wait, <laughs> I check my logs every day. Why am I just finding out about this now? Why didn't you tell me about this 89 days ago when this first started? I could have done something back then. And again, it's a limitation of Zeke that it's not writing out the log entries till the connection closes. 
So here's one of the cool things that both Rita and, uh, and I'm going to call it ACE. I, I'm tired of having to say AC Hunter Community Edition over and over again. Somebody was using the acronym ACE in the chat channel. I like that, so I will call it ACE. So with Rita or ACE, what we do is if you use our tool to install Zeke for you, we install an additional module that makes a copy of the state table every hour and compares that to the log entries that got recorded. So what will happen is, you know, hour goes by, we snapshot the state table, we look at the log entries, anything that's in the state table but not in the log entries gets recorded on this long connection screen. You can see this here says the state of all these connections are closed. They were done. And anytime I read a PCAP file, they will always get listed as closed. But if I'm having Zeke read off the network live and feed data into AC, uh, into ACE or Rita, you know, every hour live, we'll actually label things as being open on occasion. So that 90 day connection I told you about, after 24 hours, you would see the connection listed as being open for 24 hours. After 24, five hours, guess what? We're going to say it's been open for 25 hours, 26 hours, 26 hours. And now you'll see every hour counting up to that 90 days and you have plenty of time to go in and respond. Uh, oh, there's also two views here. View one is cumulative communication time. So if there's kind of a mix of beacons and long connections in there, we're going to add them all up for you. Uh, we did that mostly for like Metasploit. Metasploit when he's, uh, has an option when you set up a C2 channel that it will call out to the command and control channel um, and then hold that connection open for 30 minutes, kill it, and then immediately establish that connection again. And they do that because it really helps them fly under the radar of a lot of tools. Because for the tools that are looking for like hundreds or thousands of connections taking place in a day to tell you that's a beacon, well, they're connecting less than 50 times. So that'll stay down in the ground noise. If you have a tool that's looking for connections that are running for like eight hours or longer, well, these connections are only staying open for 30 minutes. So again, they stay down in the ground noise, but it's a 30 minute connection every 30 minutes. So add all those up and it's 24 hours worth of communication in a 24 hour period of time. So view one is cumulative communication time. View two is just individual sessions. All right, so that, is a long connection. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy. Beacons is where things can get a little bit more complicated. Because when we're talking about beacons, we're talking about connections between two endpoints. And those might be IP addresses, they might be fully qualified domain names, there's a couple of different variations that pop in here. So let's go through and talk about that. So let's start off with just plain, simple, easy to understand beacon. What does it look like? Well, my bad guy, dumps malware on this system. Again, user clicks something they shouldn't have. And that malware is pre-configured to call out to a server that the attacker controls and do it at some regular basis. In the example here, we're doing it every 600 seconds. So every 10 minutes, every 10 minutes, this thing will call out. So uh, I apologize for everybody for the little glitch. We had a little problem with Zoom. You can go back through Discord to see exactly what happened, but you know, stuff happens. Um, you didn't miss anything. We decided to take a 10 minute break and give people to join back in. So I'm just going to pick right up where I left off, which was talking about beacons. So again, this is just your standard run of the mill classic beacon. Um, my attacker gets uh, malware onto this internal system, you know, email with a link user shouldn't click, whatever the, you know, what the phishing exercise was. But what this malware does is it connects out to some box out on the internet and it does it some regular interval. You know, here this is saying every 10 minutes, but you know, it could be any time interval. This is just an example. But what this box will do is it will contact the command and control server and say, hey, check my queue. Is there any commands for me to run? And most of the time what it's going to hear back is, nope, there's nothing in your queue. Go back to sleep. And now it will dwell for whatever period of time it's pre-programmed for, check back in and say, hey, anything for me to do? Nope. Okay, I'll go back to sleep. Hey, anything for me to do? Nope, go back to sleep. So when the attacker wants to run a command, all they do is they attack, attach to this command and control server and say, hey, for this box, I want to put a command in its queue. I want to run the task list command. I want to see what's running on that system. 
So now the next time the system checks in and says, hey, do you have anything for me to do? It's told, yes, I want you to run the task list command. So now the malware will run that task list command and it will take the output from that command and exfiltrate that data back out to the command and control server. That'll then relay it back to the attacker. So if you're thinking, hey, that command and control server kind of sounds like a proxy, hey, you get it, because <laughs> that's basically what it's doing. That command and control server is proxying the connection between the attacker and the compromised host itself. Now, one of the things we're starting to say, um, and this one's pretty insidious because it's pretty stealthy, is see two through a content delivery network. What's happening here? Well, rather than having the compromised system talk to the C2 server directly, they take the C2 server, put it behind a CDN network. I've seen Amazon used for this. I've seen Akamai used for this. And this does a couple of things for the attacker. One is the C2 connections are now going out to multiple IP addresses, not just one. So it's harder to figure out that this is actually a beacon signal to deal with. Problem number two, this content delivery network is probably being used by legitimate organizations, which means there is legitimate traffic getting mixed in with this traffic as well. So in order to detect the beacon, we need to be able to collapse these down to a single endpoint and filter out all the good stuff. And it's not that easy to do. Um, the easiest way to implement it and the way it's been done within Rita and with uh, ACE is we go in and we say, okay, for HTTP traffic, we're going to look at the host parameter. For HTTPS traffic, we're going to look at the SNI information because that will identify what the final endpoint is on the other side of the CDN. And we'll use that as the external entity to go through and do our measurements to see is there a beacon here, yes or no. So when we talk about detecting beacons, most of the time we're looking at them from a timing perspective, right? That's what we were just talking about. It's going off every 60 seconds type of thing. But there's some other things that we can go in and look for too, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. I introduced the concept of jitter. And I talked about how, okay, rather than going off exactly at a 10 minute interval, it might go off, you know, plus or minus a minute. And I said, that's to avoid K-means detection, which is what most th uh, network-based threat hunting tools use. So you want to make sure you're not using k-means anymore. K-means was great five plus years ago. It's not very useful anymore. You know, you got to evolve, so to speak. You got to look for other behavioral characteristics. But one of the things we can do, and we talked about this connection quantity versus time. That was in a graph earlier. So we kind of flip through that. Uh, I talked about this screen where no jitter means that everything's going off at the same time interval. Right, so this is a beacon that is always going off at a one second interval. There's no other time intervals that are showing up in there. I talked about this one. This is cobalt strike where it's going in and it's saying, okay, I wanna go off about every 29, 28, 29 seconds, but let's vary the timing a couple of seconds. So it's not exact. And again, this will allow it to fall, fly under the reins of uh, something like uh, K-means. This is a probably arguably a much better job at randomizing the traffic than what you would normally get out of cobalt strike. So with this, notice I've got time intervals as short as five seconds, as long as 46 seconds. But, you know, it's not that cobalt strike bell curve that I talked about. This is actually a bit more random and a little bit harder to detect. So our behavioral analytics tools need to be able to go in and even though it's not a bell curve, still figure out, yeah, this is a beacon and this is something I need to go in and pay attention to. <laughs> Along with timing, we can also look for things based on session size. And we typically need to do this type of an analysis when we're dealing with things like C2 over social media. So I talked about an attacker setting up, you know, a command and control server, but they don't necessarily have to. Uh, one of the many attacks Russia has done against Ukraine was they went after their power grid and shut it down at Christmas time a number of years ago. Most folks may remember that. The command and control channel, channel they used was a tool called Gchat. What Gchat does is it uses Gmail as the command and control server. So the malware checks a specific email inbox and it looks for inbound email to tell it what to do. Well, of course, the challenge with that 
is it's going off at the same interval, time interval that a regular Gmail client would every 10 to 12 seconds. So we can't rely on timing anymore. And it's just checking email, same as a regular email client would. What makes it a little bit different and allows us to detect it is the consistency in the session size. Your average business user sends and receives about 112 emails a day. Right, that's direct messages, that's because I'm part of the everyone group, whatever the case may be. And those emails tend to be different sizes. So when you do a session size analysis against a regular email account, what you'll see is you'll see a big peak at a very small session size, and then about 112 other small peaks that show up because of all the different emails that have shown up. Most of the time you're gonna find that every email is a slightly unique size. So you're going to see a bunch of little tiny peaks that are larger than that. When it's C2, when it's actually something like GCAT, the attacker probably isn't interacting with it 112 times. You know, it's probably something less than that. So if you see a very strong session size signal and only one or two times that that session size got larger, that's worth going in and paying attention to. That may be, um, that may be command and control. Not many threat hunting tools do an analysis based on session size. Uh, Rita does, Ace does, uh, but there aren't many out others out there that do. What most of them do is simply ignore <laughs> uh, LinkedIn and you know Gmail and all those possible social media command and control channels. You don't want to ignore them. You want to be able to keep an eye on. So here's a good example. So my heartbeat is my, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. That's typically going to be my smallest session size. You might see something smaller down around like 40 bytes. And typically what that means is the uh, compromise system tried to check in and the connection was rejected for some reason. Then maybe the command and control server was too busy at the time or something along those lines. Um, so if you see 40 bytes or less, yeah, that's just a failed connection attempt. Don't worry about those. But your smallest session size besides that, that's going to be your, do you have anything for me to do? Yes or no. Anything larger than that is indicative of that command and control channel being activated. Somebody's actually doing something across it. So let's imagine we're threat hunters. This is the data we've collected. And our boss comes to us and says, hey, that box you said has been compromised. That has a 100 megabyte database on it that is all of our customers' private information. It would really be horrible if that gets out, not the least of which that we would have to do a public disclosure. Did they get that database, yes or no? Now, with most tools would be, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. It's hard to tell, right? With this, we can tell. What's my largest session size here? Let's round up, we'll call it 300 bytes. 300 bytes of data was the maximum amount of data that traveled over the C2 channel. If someone said, copy that customer database, that would be a 100 meg transfer. If they compressed it first, maybe they get it down to like 50 megs or something like that, but you get the idea. We've got nothing even close to that. So if this is the data we have, we can tell our boss, hey, so long as we get them away from that system now, right now, now, they haven't gotten that customer database yet. We don't have to disclose. We haven't leaked that information out. Now, what if we see a 75 megabyte data transfer? Can we prove it was the customer database? No, we can't. We can't because it's encrypted. Well, what if we get a TLS intercept proxy, Chris? You know, when everything goes to the TLS intercept proxy. Yeah, you could do that. But my, what I've seen over the last couple of years are is attackers are encrypting their data and then funneling it through TLS. It kind of burns my britches a little bit because um, I, I've talked to some of these vendors who are doing intercept proxies and you know they'll sell their customers on it saying, oh, we'll decrypt the data. We'll make sure there's nothing malicious in it. And then you know we'll send it off on the other way. And now you're you know with an intercept proxy, you've got a digital certificate that everybody will always trust and you've opened up a huge point of vulnerability on your network just for the benefit of being able to spend six figures on their hardware box that's going to go through and encrypt the data. And I was at a conference, uh, I think about a year ago, 
where I was talking to one of these vendors and I'm like, yeah, but everything's encrypted. And the response I got back was, well, yeah, but we're stripping off the TLS layer. So at least you're that much closer to the actual data. No, no, that's not how encryption works. It's not like a, you know, a fuzzy lens or something or a flashlight where you can say, well, I've got a little bit of light so I can see a little bit of what's going on. No, no, no. Ciphertext is ciphertext. It doesn't matter if it's encrypted once or a hundred times. It's still ciphertext. Your signatures where you're trying to pattern match on stuff isn't going to work. You know, it doesn't fly that way. So their concept to me, you know, their, their statement to me about, well, at least you're that much close to the data tells me you have no freaking clue what you're doing. You're just trying to, you know, convince people to spend a lot of money with you. Come on, because that does not help. But with session size, we can at least make some educated guesses about what's going on. When I look at this screen, this tells me, okay, they're still just poking around. They're checking connectivity, uh, maybe looking for processes owned by a user, dir in a single directory without many files in it. There's not much taking place on this thing yet. Again, if we can get them out now, we're going to be in pretty good shape. So with session size we, analysis, we don't know exactly what they're doing, but we could get a much better es estimate than if we tried using like an intercept proxy or something that's just going to try and pattern match on encrypted data anyway. Can I get false positives? Well, sort of, right? We, you know, we, we're talking about looking for connection persistency. We said the first thing, we once we identify persistency, the next thing we need to identify is business need. Some of these persistent connections, there will be you know, legitimate business need for. Windows notification service, I see that all the time. Windows box is checking to see, is there anything on the Windows notification bus that they need to pop up on your screen, right? Every Windows system is going to go off and check for that. There's going to be a persistent connection involved with it, but there's a business need behind it. Now, you can argue, do you want to be sending that type of data to Microsoft? Yes or no. That rep depends upon the security profile of your organization. That's an internal decision. But for a majority of organizations, having your Windows systems look for patches, having your Windows systems talk to a Windows notification service isn't considered an increase in your threat profile. For some of them, it is, and you want to do something about that. But when we talk about safe listing things, I'm going to address it from your average environment perspective. We're like having your systems patch and stuff like that is okay. So identifying business need, you know, that really kind of starts with identifying, do I recognize where this traffic is going? You know, again, I run Windows systems and it's connecting to Microsoft.com or Windows.com. Okay, that one's pretty easy. You know, but what if it's attaching, you know, what if it's connecting to a host that I run down and find out it's, you know, in the example.com domain? How do I figure out if there's a business need behind that or not? Well, if I can't find some generic reason, like it's checking time, patches, the usual stuff, my next step might be to go to the purchasing department and say, hey, are we paying example.com for any types of services? And they might come back and say, yeah. The marketing team is paying them. Great. Now we know, okay, who authorized that PO? Let's go to the marketing team. Hey, why are we paying example.com? Oh, because we're sending them prospect information and they're helping to optimize our sales tunnel. And there's a business need for that. Great. Now we can go in and we can safe list that off. So once we identify connection persistency, our next goal is to identify if there's a business need associated with it. If it is, great, safe list it. We don't need to worry about it anymore. And what's nice about that is tomorrow or next week when we do a hunt, that data won't show up because we safe listed it off. It's moved it out of the way. We can always get it back. We can just remove the safe list entry. But what's nice about that is the first time we hunt our network, it might take us three days to hunt a day's worth of data. It might, depending upon how busy our environment is. But when we start safe listing things out, we don't need to check that stuff again. So as long as we're creating our safe list entries properly, you know, that first hunt, like I said, it might take us two days to hunt a day's worth of data. But the next time, it's probably going to take us less than a day. And the next time after that, it'll probably take us four hours. And then after that, it's probably like a half hour. And that's it. Because once we've safe listed all, everything that our systems are doing that are legitimate, the only thing we're really interested in are new things that pop up that we didn't expect to see, right? 
that isn't going to take nearly as much time to go through and hunt down. So check the destination IP. Does the geolocation information help? I, I know it isn't 100% accurate geo, but it sometimes it helps. You know, I had a site I was working with and we figured out they had five IP addresses that were all beaconing to Kwanzu, China. And that made the conversation pretty easy, right? Do you have a field office in Kwanzu, China? No. Do you have a business partner there? No. Do you have a vendor that you can identify that's there? No. Okay, you got a problem, right? Or it's, you know, going to dot RU and you know you don't do business there. Yeah, okay, that's a problem. So sometimes that geo information can help. <laughs> But, you know, do you recognize that target organization? That's going to be our second pass with this. Now, there are some links out there that can help you. And I gave you a list of them here. One of the cool things you can do with uh, ACE is, let me show you this real quick, because this is kind of fun. So I've got this IP. So I've got traffic going out to this IP address. It's going to UDP 123. So it looks like it's NTP traffic. Let's say I want to find out more information about that system. I could go to one of those links that I showed you on the slide. Or if I just click on the IP address, notice what pops up. I get a little pop down, a pop up here. And I can go to any of these sites. Let's check Alien Vault and see what Alien Vault knows about that IP address. So this will automatically connect out to Alien Vault, feed in that IP address, and then it'll load up the database. And yeah, of course, I had to pick a site that's running slow at the moment, right? Let me pick another one. Virus Total, they're usually pretty zippy. Here we go. And Virus Total comes through one of the couple of things I love about Virus Total, right? First is it gives me green or red to tell me if anything bad has been seen in the past. That's always helpful. And if it's bad, it tells me who submitted it and how many times, and that can kind of help me figure things out, right? Because I've seen people say, oh, it's spamming and scanning and this and that. And yeah, no, you clearly you don't understand any of this stuff. If you think it's doing everything all at the same time, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just clicking boxes. Give me a break. But the other thing it does, which I think is really cool, is it goes through and shows me a history. Notice this goes back all the way to October to show me what has been the fully qualified domain name that's associated with that. Well, notice it's been pretty consistently ntp.org. Now that tells me, yeah, this is probably a legitimate NTP site. Now, if, it, if it's ntp.org today, but yesterday and before that it was example.ru, you know, <laughs> no, something's wrong. Or there's no history that goes back more than a day or two. No, no, something's wrong. So knowing what's been associated with that IP over a given period of time can really help out as well. Uh, yep, an alien vault finally uh, kicked up. There are some AV detects in here, so I could go through those to see what's going on. Um, I, I am, with an NTP server, I am suspicious that this is actually a real detect. This may have been something that was on the endpoint and the uh, malware was checking the time for some reason. Um, that's more likely the situation here. So it's not that the site itself is handing out malware. It's malware uses that site to check what time it is. I've seen a couple of uh, different packages that have gone through and done that. But if you're not using ACE, here's all those links to work with right here. All right. Let's go through and talk a little bit about uh, what we do next. So we've identified connection persistency. We've researched it and can't figure out a legitimate business need that's associated with this persistent connection. Once we've done that, what do we do next? The next thing I do is I start looking at the protocol. And one of the easiest places to start, what protocol was being used? Was it some sort of remote access? Was it something you know, like Modbus? Modbus should stay internal. That should not be going out over the internet. So am I seeing a protocol being used that I don't feel should be passing my perimeter? If, if so, you know, step one, why is it being allowed to pass the perimeter? Maybe we need to tighten down some firewall rules. But number two, now I got to figure out why. Why is this running on that system? The other thing I can go looking for is unknown applications on a standard port. This is fairly common as well. So I've seen attackers that will obfuscate their data and then send it to TCP 443. 
So TCP 443 is the well-known port for HTTPS. I expect any traffic going to port TCP 443 to be using TLS to protect that data for data privacy, right? Well, since it's TLS and it tends to be encrypted, most sites don't bother doing any types of a check against stuff against that port. So if I just take my data and simply obfuscate it, most people can't tell the difference whether it's actually being encrypted or not. And it tends to just kind of blow out. Nobody pays any attention to it. So one of the things you want to look at is what is the protocol? One of the cool things about using Zeek, Zeek recognizes about 55 different protocols. So it will tell you, hey, that traffic going to TCP 443, it'll always label it as SSL. And maybe it's SSL, maybe it's TLS. You got to look at the logs to tell the difference. But it will at least tell you, you know, yeah, this is being, you know, data privacy has been applied here. But if it pops up and says, yeah, I'm seeing traffic going to TCP 443 and I don't know what it is. Yeah, that's when I start getting a little nervous. Okay, what, what's, or, or it tells you something like, oh, it's SSH traffic. Why is SSH going over TCP 443? That, that's probably not a good thing. Let me go in and check that one a little bit closer. So Zeek, this says detects over 55, uh, 50 applications. Yeah, I think it's up to about 55. And if there's something you want that you don't see there, you can go in and you can add in modules for that. So here's an example, right? So if I go in and just look at my raw Zeek logs, Zeek will go through and label, oh, this is DNS traffic, this is HTTP traffic, and so on. Notice here it doesn't recognize what it is. So this was traffic going to port 80. I expect to see it labeled as HTTP, but it's not. Well, if I look at the amount of bytes going back and forth, that tells me this was a failed connection. If Zeek didn't act, if the a TCP connection didn't go complete the three packet handshake, Zeke can't tell you what was going to go across it because there was no application layer to go through and analyze. You'll notice that on long connections sometimes. If I've had a long connection that's been running for more than 24 hours, that initial handshake has already gone by. ACE may say, I don't know what the protocol is. You may have to go back a day or two and look at when that connection was created to see what protocol was actually being used. But here's what you'll see with ACE. So down in the com column, you'll see something like this. You may even see, it'll say, hey, I saw TCP 443 and I didn't recognize it, but I also saw TCP 443 and it was SSL. If you see that, don't sweat it. Because again, what probably happened was one of the connections failed. One of the times it tried to connect, the servers said, whoa, I'm too busy right now, go away, come back later. And that's why it didn't recognize the application. So long as you see the application being recognized, you're in pretty good shape. <laughs> Unexpected protocol usage. So this is, it's not breaking the communication rules, but it's certainly bending them a little bit. Sometimes you can run into that, which is why it's good to kind of understand for the protocols you're going to let cross your perimeter, you need to understand how they normally work. And I'll give you a good example. So command and control over DNS doesn't break any rules, but it certainly bends them. Here's how it works. So imagine I'm this bad guy. I've you know got this user to click something they shouldn't have. And I don't want the compromised system to call out directly to the command and control server. Because if it does, you may detect new traffic leaving the system and you might figure out it's in a compromised state. So I want to hide my outbound traffic somehow. Well, I can't stealth it because, again, it's the network traffic. The best I can do is obfuscate it. So what I do, excuse me, is I have my command and control server listen on the DNS port. So I go out and I register a domain. For the sake of example here, let's say I registered evil.com. Well, when I register evil.com, one of the things I have to provide is the IP addresses of at least two name servers, right? The IPs I provide, my command and control servers. So now my compromised system wants to call home. What it does is it does a lookup within this domain that I registered, and it uses some sort of special code to identify who it is. You know, hey, I'm this particular compromised system, because there might be multiple, and whatever type of data request it's doing. Hey, is there anything in my more queue? Whatever the case may be. It does this as a DNS query, 
but instead of sending it out directly, it sends it to the local resolver, same as it would with any other DNS query. The resolver gets this and says, oh, I don't have an answer to that. Let me go out to the root name servers. Hey, root name servers, I need an answer to this query. And the root name servers come back and say, oh, we can't answer that, go to the .com servers. So now my resolver goes to the .com servers, asks the same question, and the, and the .com servers say, oh, I can't answer that, but I can tell you this system is authoritative for evil.com. Go talk to it. And now my DNS server sends that query to that system, and now that command and control server knows, hey, that compromised box, box is online, and it's waiting for marching orders. And now it'll hand something back. Yeah, run the task list command or go look at what files are in this directory, whatever the case may be. The answer that comes back is the answer to that question, is there anything in my work queue, yes or no? Now, one of the side effects of this is the attacker can't use a consistent string for the system to identify itself. And the reason for that is DNS caching. Right, Because if it goes to look this up the first time, it'll go out and go all the way to the command and control server. Let's say the system tries to check again 10 seconds later. Well, the resolver is going to say, oh, I have that answer in cache. Here's the cached response to that answer. Well, we've, it's now just broken that command and control channel, right? And the attackers don't want to break that connectivity. So what they'll do is they'll change this query every single time. Well, Chris, why don't they just set a higher TTL? Yeah, they could do that but the resolver could override that. Back in my net admin days, I don't care what you set your TTL to, I remembered everything for a minimum of five minutes, just to reduce the amount of traffic going out over my link. So I'm not doing constant DNS queries for things. You know, it helped to get back some of my link speed, if you will. So the resolver can always overwrite any TTL that's set by the target domain. And the attackers know that. So the only way to make sure this works consistently, change the query every time. Well, this adds an interesting question. How many resource records does it make sense for a system to, for a domain to expose to the internet? And for most environments, it's 10 or less, right? Think about it. how many DNS records are you going to have? You're going to have a web server, a mail server, a couple of DNS servers, maybe a DKIM record, possibly a customer portal. You know, hey, look, we're still counting fingers on one hand. We haven't even made it to 10. So, you know, pick a round number of 10 it, for the domains we don't recognize, it's going to be 10 or less. Now, there are large environments that everybody's heard of, like Microsoft, Akamai, Google, that you might see a couple hundred coming out of, but it's a known domain. You know that isn't going to be a target point for C2. Anytime you get up to over a thousand, oh yeah, it's going to be suspicious regardless. So one of the things we can look at is the DNS utilization to figure out if that's what's actually going on. So let me give you an example. So if you want to follow along, I've got the DNS CAT2 JA3 strobe data set loaded. So you can just click that. Uh, so I went to, let me walk back through it. You can go to settings, go to database, click this one, click confirm, and it'll go through and load it up. And you'll notice up here, it's telling me two potential C2 over DNS cases detected. So if I click on that or... If I click on DNS down here, either one will be fine. I'll see this screen here. Now I'm going to drop the threshold below 1,000 just so we can see everything. I'm going to set it to five, just some small number. <clears throat> but it's flagging this domain here. This is a subdomain, but it's flagging this domain here. Why? Because it's telling me we looked up 62,468 unique resource records within that domain. Oh, that's a lot. That's way too many for a domain I've never heard of before, right? I mean, we said, you know, Amazon AWS.com, we might see a couple of hundred if we're using EC2, maybe close to a thousand, but probably not much more than that, even if we're a large class A environment that's global. 62,000 for a domain we've never heard of. Oh, that, that looks really bad. That looks really bad. The other thing the tool goes through and does is it looks at utilization. So if I go down to uh, akadns.net, so that's Akamai, we looked up 125 resource records within that domain. Okay, well, that sounds like a lot. Think about who we're talking about here. This is Akamai. This is the largest content delivery network in the world, bar none. Everybody, even like Microsoft, uses them. 
So the fact that we looked up 125 resource records for the biggest CDN in the world, that does not surprise me. Now, if I look on the right, ACE has gone through and broken down uh, utilization. I had three internal IP addresses that were responsible for doing all of the DNS lookups within that domain. Well, if these are my local resolvers, that makes perfect sense, right? Further, ACE is telling me that these internal systems connected to one or more of those 125 systems this many times. In other words, this is how we expect DNS to work, right? User types a name in the browser, DNS resolves it to an IP address, the user connects to that IP address. This is what we expect to see. <clears throat> if I go back to this top entry, I've got one system doing DNS queries, but more importantly, my DNS servers are the only thing talking to resource records in that domain. Well, that makes no sense, right? Why did we have to look up 62,000 plus resource records if none of my users needed to access any of those resources? That's another clear indication to us that we've got C2 over DNS taking place. <clears throat> and I just went through and just kind of called all this out in the slides. Look for, all, uh, so I hear this a lot, but you got to do this the right way. Look for odd HTTP user agent strings. What do I mean by that? You know, like the one we always hear is, oh, look for unique user agent strings. Look for, you know, unique JA3 hashes. If you're not familiar with what a JA3 hash is, um, J J JA3 was developed by the sales folks security team. Really cool idea. What they do is they take the SSL client hello that a client will send a server during an HTTPS connection, and they simply hash it. Right? What protocols were negotiated in what order? And they'll generate a hash off of that. And now you can check that hash to see <clears throat> what was negotiated and in what order and you know what's the operating system and what protocols were supported and all of that. And the concept is, you know, if everybody's running Windows 10 using the same version of Chrome, that hash should be the same consistently across the board. So what a lot of folks go looking for is, what are the unique things, right? What's like the one system that has a J3 hash that doesn't match anybody else? Or what's the one system that has a user agent strength that doesn't match everybody else? That's what they go looking for. And I actually do it a little bit differently. <clears throat> what I go looking for is, does the operating system get identified consistently? If I look at this example here, I've got a system that is going through and for 15 different IP addresses that it talked to out on the internet and identified itself as Windows 10. For another 12 I, different IP addresses it talked to out on the internet, it went through and it um, identified itself as Windows 10 again, just with a slightly different user agent string. But this one IP address out on the internet that when it talks to it, it identifies itself as being Windows XP. That doesn't make sense, right? Maybe somebody's running a VM with Windows XP in it and they're accessing this one site. I mean, that's possible, but that's an edge case. <laughs> that's <laughs> unlikely. Malware tends to use a unique string that looks legitimate, but is different from what most people are going to be using so it can identify itself to the command and control server. <laughs> so it isn't so much that this is unique because we may actually find that there were 3,000 plus connections that took place in the course of a day. This might actually be the most popular user agent string that's being seen. What makes this unique is that most of the time this box is identifying itself as Windows 10. It's only when it talks to this one system that all of a sudden it thinks it's the Windows XP box. That's really scary. And the same thing for JAW3, right? Same thing when we look at the JAW3 hashes. You know, if it can consistently identifies itself a certain way, but changes it when it talks to one particular host on the internet, that's something we need to be concerned about. So we've gone through and analyzed the protocol, and we're still not sure if that system's compromised or okay. What do we do next? Well, next, we need to go take a look at the internal system. So hopefully we've got a SIM, we've got some log entries we're collecting, maybe those uh, Sys, uh, Sysmon ID3s that I was talking about. Now we can go look at what application was running. If we don't have a SIM collecting that stuff, 
maybe we've got some general network stuff we can collect. You know, how's it, you know, how does that system passively fingerprint itself, right? When it creates a TCP session, does it look like Windows 10 or does it look like Windows 7? That's going to help me figure out, you know, which one I need to be most concerned about type of thing. So if I can leverage internal host logging, not as my first line, but as my fallback once I've got context on the network, this can be super helpful. So again, we're not writing signatures in our SIM to try and find things because we're now we're pattern matching without context. You know, my, one of my favorites is I've got another one where um, you see a, you see an internal system connecting to a host out on the internet. And when you drill down to see what application is making the connection, it's Notepad. Well, wait, Notepad shouldn't be collecting, connecting the things out on the internet. Well, seeing that a user ran Notepad, you know, in your SIM log, you probably never worry about that. But having the context of this is the application making constant connections to an IP address, now you know, yeah, no, that's definitely not the Notepad. I think it is. Runtime broker, same type of thing. Every Windows system, you know, 10 onward is running Runtime broker. So the fact that you saw that that ran isn't going to worry you if all you're looking at is just your SIM. But again, in the context we looked at it in, it was making connections to DigitalOcean, not back to Microsoft. That is a problem. In that context, we know that's an applic that application is not the one we think it is. We need to play, pay attention to that. And just here's an example of what Sysmon outputs. And if you look at this, this is pretty cool. It's identifying when did this ap application execute? What was the full path to it? So now I can look at the, if I see my an internal system with a persistent connection, I can look at that and say, okay, hey, Sysmon, tell me what's going on, or Beaker, tell me what's going on. Oh, hey, that was Slack making those connections. Well, if we're a Slack shop, this is okay. If we're not a Slack shop, <laughs> this might not be okay. This might be something worth going in and paying attention to. Or if it's runtime broker or if it's notepad, you get the idea. Yep, and here's that notepad example that I was talking about. So I had an internal system talking to a host on the internet. Uh, this is per minute that these are showing up. So on a per minute basis, I'm getting about 20 connections taking place. Okay. Persistent connection from Notepad going to an IP address in DigitalOcean. Again, this is a problem. This is something I need to go in and pay attention to. But I have no system logs. Well, you may want to start collecting something. You know, even if you can't collect logs off the endpoint, you may want to collect some data off of the network itself. I've got some tools in the tools section that we can talk about that'll kind of help you through that. So what next? Well, once we get done, like I said, this is binary. It's real easy. Do I feel confident the system is still in a uh, pristine condition? Do I feel confident that the system has been compromised? I need to come up with a zero or a one, a yes or a no. I think it's safe or it's not for every single one of my IP addresses. If I can't make that determination, I've got to come up with a test that will help me figure that out. So again, I might need to sniff all the traffic coming off of that system. If it's generating host log entries, I may need to go in and check that. You know, I need to do something to help me figure out the binary state of that system. Is it compromised? Is it okay? So let's talk about some tools. So I talk about TCP dump mostly because it's been around forever. And it's usually available on just about every non-Windows platform that's out there. Uh, there is a Windows version called WinDump that you can go through and use if you want to. Uh, but what I like about it is it's fairly lightweight. It doesn't generate an awful lot of overhead to go in and create packet captures. What I don't like about it is it's not very customizable. Uh, the output you get out is the output you get out. There's a terse option to reduce what gets output. There's a verbose option. You can have dash V, dash VV, or dash VVV. Um, you can do dash capital X to see a decode of the payload. But I can't do things like go in and say, hey, I only want to see the source IP address, the TTL, and the IP ID. No, no, no. That's a dash VVV, and you're going to get a ton of other data, and you're going to have to search through that data to find the stuff that you're actually interested in. So it's a little limited in its output. 
but it is great for doing things like making PCAPs. So this was a great script that Bill came up with that will run TCB dump <clears throat> for an hour, capture all the traffic over that hour, save it to a compressed file, name it with a date timestamp, and then continue to capture. So now what I end up with is a bunch of PCAP files that are all at one hour intervals. So I can go through and do it that way. If you want to change the time interval, just simply change the number of sections that it's going in and capturing for. When I'm talking about packet decoding, T-Shark, I probably lean a little bit more towards this tool. There's a couple of different tools I like for different specific use cases, but for general purpose, I probably use T-Shark more than anything else. Uh, and part of the reason for that is, so T-Shark, if you're not familiar with it, uh, this is part of the Wireshark suite. So when you grab Wireshark, you're grabbing T-Shark, or you can choose to install T-Shark by itself. But one of the nice things about T-Shark is I can go in and I can tell T-Shark, this, I only want to see this parameter, or I only want to see these particular fields within my packets. So here I'm telling T-Shark, read this capture file, and I want to, don't give me a gen generic summary, I want to specify the fields I want to see. And specifically what I want to see is the DNS query that people are sending out. I'm limiting traffic to UDP port 53, which I didn't have to do. If I didn't, it's simply going to ignore and skip any packets that aren't DNS traffic. But here I just said, yep, UDP port 53 and pumping it through head dash 10 just says print out 10 lines of output. But you can see here, here are all my DNS queries going by. So I can focus in on just the data that I actually care about, which is kind of nice. Here's another one looking at user agent strings. So I can go in and extract out specific user agent strings. Tap infos is also part of the T-Shark suite. It's a separate tool, but what Cap infos is great for is just doing a quick evaluation of that PCAP file. So if I go in and I just run Cap infos, right? If I, uh, well, yeah, let me give you an example. Always helps to have examples, right? So I'm gonna go into the labs directory and I'm just gonna go into the lab one directory. And if you look, there's a bunch of log files in here, but what I, uh, oh, I don't, I didn't put a PCAP on here. Oh, okay. I can't show you that on this one. Ah, but I'm sure I got another. Give me just a sec here. Just because uh, CAP infos is one of those tools that I find super useful and most people don't even know it exists. <laughs> so I want to kind of show you what you can do with this tool. So this system should have PCAPs on it. Yes, it does. Yay. So I've got one called decode one here. So I'm going to say cap infos decode one. And cap infos is going to come back and tell me. Let me scroll this back up a little bit. Here's the name of the file. Here's where how what created it. This was done on an Ethernet network. Um, you know, here's the size of the the maximum packet size that was used. Here's the number of packets that are in there. And you get the idea. I get a ton of information that shows up here. When was it started? When did it end? Uh, some encapsulation information, the the packet rate as stuff went by, how busy was the network at the time. Now, for the purposes of threat hunting, I usually use AUE as a switch. And what AUE shows me is how long was that capture run for? When did it start? When did it end? Because when we're talking about captures, we're talking about, you know, we said we want 24 hours worth of data. Well, 24 hours worth of data is 86,400 seconds. I don't have that here. I have 18,000. So I have less than a half a day, less than eight hours worth of data here to work with. So I probably, so if I was doing, if I needed to hunt this PCAP for some reason, one of the first things I wouldn't bother doing, long connection check. Why? Well, because for long connections, I tend to check for 20 sec, 20,000 seconds or more. That's about five and a half hours. And we don't have that much data here to work with. It's less than five hours worth of data. So I might find stuff that's been running for five hours, but I'm going to get a lot of stuff in there that's probably okay. That isn't actually a real long connection. So that's that tool. Wireshark, I think most people know this tool, right? Wireshark is kind of my last tool I use. 
when I'm dealing with large amounts of data, I'm going to work with something else. I'm going to work with NGREP. I'm going to work with T-Shark or something, some other tool to kind of whittle through to find the really interesting stuff. Once I find like a single session I want to dig on deeper, that's when I'll go in and I'll start working with Wireshark. Wireshark is very cumbersome to go in and try and work with. When I go in and I say, I want to read a PCAP file, it's going to read that whole PCAP file into memory, whereas T-Shark can actually work through it line by line. So can TCP dump. So it takes less time to actually go through and do what you need to do with it. Uh, but it's graphical based. It gives you a lot of information. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's a great tool. Um, I just don't find it useful for finding the interesting bits in large data sets. I find it far more interesting for, I think something's weird with this session between these two specific IP addresses, and I want to go do a deeper analysis on that. Zeke, we already went in and talked about. Uh, Neil, real-time analysis, one plus hour latency, yes. Yeah. So Zeke is going to go in, if you're running Zeke on your network, Every hour, it will go out and write out log entries that is all the data it saw from the previous hour. So every hour, you get a new hour. So you're always working about an hour late, you know, versus what's actually happening live on the wire at the time. But it gives you some really good level of detail. And there's a couple of ways to tell Zeek to log. You can do it in CSV format or you can do it in uh, JSON format. JSON is great when you want to go read it into another tool. I highly recommend you go with the default and just leave it in CSV format because it's a whole lot easier to be able to go in and manipulate. It allows you to use things like Zcut. So with Zcut, I can go in and I can look at specific files. Let me show you an example here real quick. So if you want to follow along, I'm in the lab one directory and I'm just going to say less space dash capital S uh, X25. So dash capital S says, don't line wrap. Let things go off the right-hand side of the screen. And I will use the right arrow if I need to go get to that. X25 says, I allocate 25 um, characters for each column. It just helps to kind of keep things from running together. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to look at con.log. So when I run that command, here's my Zeke log. So this is my timestamp in Unix format. Here is a unique identifier for that session. So I could search for this value in all my Zeek logs and any other place that log this connection, like my HTTP.log or my SSH.log file or what have you, it'll show me that information too. But here's my source IP address, source port. If I hit my right arrow, that's now showing me my destination IP address, my destination port. This is telling me this is HTTP traffic. This is telling me that um, this connection ran for 477 seconds. SF identifies what TCP flags were seen in the course of the session. SF means it saw from the start of this packet, the TCP three packet handshake, all the way through FIN, the end of the session, uh, you know, the FINAC exchange at the end. S0 means, hey, it saw the beginning of the session, but it didn't see the session actually closed. And I'm not going to go through every column, but you can see there's a lot of information in here that Z keeps track of, which is kind of cool. Chris? Yo! Can you reshow that command once more for the people who are watching it here? I can okay, do great. one, but better, I am going to throw that into the Discord channel. Perfect. Thanks much. And just so you know where I was when I ran it, let me throw that in there too. Thank you, Bill. Sometimes I end up just kind of buzzing along and don't notice stuff like that when they pop by. So yeah, if you CD into that directory I shared in the Discord channel and then run that command I just gave you before that, your output should kind of look like that. Now, when you're in here, it's not obvious how to quit. Just hit the letter Q and that'll get you back to the command line. Cool beans. So that was the everything that was in that log file. What if I don't want to see everything? What if I only want to see certain fields? Well, each of those fields had a title along the top. You probably noticed that. So if I pull this back up again real quick. So TS is my timestamp. 
UID is my unique identifier field. ID.org underscore H is my source IP address. So each of these columns have a title. I know they don't line up exactly, and that's because they got some, they've got the pound fields at the beginning of it, and that throws everything off uh, by one column. But you get the idea. So these columns have titles to them. With Z cut, I can go in and I can just say, show me this specific column. So here I'm telling Z cut, go into the SSL.log file. And if there's multiple, search all the SSL.log files. And I'm telling Z cut, show me source IP address. This is the destination IP address. This is the destination port. This is the validation status of the digital certificate. Yes, Z can check digital certificates on the fly. Kind of a neat feature. And then I'm grepping for self-signed. What this is going to show me is, so grep goes in and all that output, right? So it's going to, this first command is going to list out all my source destination IPs, the destination port, and the validation status of the digital certificate. Grep is going to say, okay, out of all those lines, only show me the ones that have the character string self-signed in it. And then I'm just sort unique to reduce the number of output I'm seeing. But this is going to show me anytime somebody talked to a self-signed digital certificate. I want to make sure if I want to look to see uh, any digital certificate that didn't validate properly, I could say grep space dash V everything but space OK. Because Zeke will identify a digital certificate as OK if it validated properly. If it didn't, it's going to print something else. So dash V says show me everything but the digital certificates that look like they were OK. <laughs> A question, can we have the columns and the entries aligned? Is there any special command? Becomes difficult to track in the output which entries correspond to which columns. Uh, learner, unfortunately, not that I've been able to find. If someone's got a great trick for that, go for it. But the problem is the columns don't start left justified, same as the data. There's a uh, piece of information that says pound fields in that first column. And that throws the titles off all the way down. Now, I could delete that, and that would fix it for that one file. But now I'm going to run into it again for every other file that I run into, that I go through and use. So I just kind of get used to it. <laughs> um, and what I'll do is I'll um, use Zcut to extract out only what I need. And then it doesn't matter anyway, because now all the columns will line up properly. <clears throat> Dash D for human format. So yeah, like I said, this is the number of clicks that have gone by since January 1st, 1970. What if I don't want to see that? What if I actually want to see, you know, a date timestamp that makes sense? Well, I can use dash lowercase d for that. The challenge with it, though, is notice I can see year, month, day, hour, minute, seconds, and then this is offset from GMT. Well. I might have hundreds or thousands of packets go by in a second and notice this can kind of conflates them all together, right? So I've got what, one, two, three, four, five, six that all took place in that, you know, zero, zero second period of time. I don't get to see that they actually came in in what order. So that's why the uh, Unix format is used by default. Another tool you may want to consider, Passer. So Passer is the creation of uh, Mr. Bill Stearns, who's been helping folks out in support. Thank you for that, Bill. And Passer is just a really cool tool that just kind of sits back, watches what your systems are doing, and starts uh, databasing and cataloging what it sees. So for example, it's telling me that these ports are open on this system, not because it probed them like Nmap would, but because it saw someone talking to that port. So if it sees a conversation taking place with the port, it now knows, oh, okay, hey, that port is in an open state. So it just passively kind of sits back and learns what is where on your network, uh, which I just find really, really cool. Um, the other thing you can integrate into Passer is Smudge. So you can run Smudge on its own or you can integrate it into Passer, but Smudge does passive fingerprinting. So what it does is it looks at TCP SYN packets 
and looks for the little nuances that are associated with certain operating systems and will go through and identify it accordingly. So my system that was identifying itself as Windows 10, I could use smudge to see, okay, when it generates TCP packets, what does that look like? And if it fingerprints as Windows 10, yeah, okay, that's a Windows 10 system. It's not Windows XP, something's wrong. It's falsely identifying itself for some reason. That's something I may want to go in and uh, pay attention to. If you're interested in smudge or passer, um, they are available right on our website. So if you type in acm.re, that just redirects you to the activecountermeasures.com website, which I like typing it in that way because, hey, I'm lazy. But here is passer, here is smudge. You can go up, read about them, see how they work, download them there if you're interested. And again, those are free tools. You know, there's no, no cost for going through and using them, but they're pretty cool. Um, I'm really excited about smudge because there hasn't been a good passive fingerprinting tool out there since P0F a good 20 years ago. NGREP is also a cool tool. So I talked about how grep can be used to search a file for a particular character string. NGREP does the same thing, but it does it on the network, which is kind of nice. So I can actually search packets for a particular text string. So here I'm telling ngrep dash Q, dash Q means don't print out a pound symbol for every packet you checked that didn't have the character string I was interested in. Uh, by default, ngrep will print out pound signs, which is just to make sure you know it's actually working and doing something. Hey, I checked this packet and nothing was there. Of course, the problem you end up with is, woo, all the pound symbols just scroll everything off the screen and it becomes kind of useless at that point. So I say, don't print out pound signs, dash capital I, read this PCAP file, look for this character string, admin, capital A-D-M-I-N. And notice it flagged this TCP session from this IP address, this upper port, going to this IP address, this port. The get request had the word character string admin in it. So it grabbed that and it showed me a copy of that packet. Hmm. I wonder what I might find if I search for things like login or password. Hmm. Something to kind of think about. <laughs> and then there's Rita. So Rita is our command line based threat hunting tool. Uh, this has been what we've open sourced for many years now. It uses Zeek logs to go in and identify connection persistency. So the concept is, hey, I had a million connections go out to the internet yesterday. I need to figure out which ones were persistent. So I can figure out if there's a business need associated with them. That's what Reader is designed to find for you. Hey, out of those millions of connections, here's the dozen or so you need to go in and make sure you pay attention to. It's command line base, which can be better or worse for some people, depending upon what you're trying to, uh, what you're trying to accomplish. So I used to do this class with Rita. So if you want to see Reader in action, you can go to YouTube and catch an old video of this class and all the labs were being done using Rita. But for this one, we're going to go through in and, and yep, all the stuff that Rita checks. We're going to use the community edition. We're going to use ACE. So this will be a graphical interface. It does basically the same thing as Rita plus more. For example, Rita didn't actually score your internal systems to tell you which systems you need to take a look at first. It show you the sessions but not the systems. This kind of helps you figure out which of my boxes that might actually be, be a pain. And tell you what we're gonna do. It is the top of the hour. So we're into hour two now, yay. So let's go through and take a 10 minute break. And when we come back, we'll go through, we'll talk about community edition and then we'll keep going from there. Yeah, I see somebody uh, posted a little graphic that says the virtual machine is using a hardware version that is not supported by this version of VMware Workstation. So uh, I use 17. So if you're using 16 or prior, you got to uh, import it and uh, make it a little bit user, looser or tell it you needed to use backwards compatibility. Um, I think Bill has some... Uh, <laughs> Bill has some uh, things in there to go through and kind of help with that. Uh, sorry if I scared you when I came back on. I will start quieter next time and then just kind of work my voice up from there. So I apologize if somebody had headphones on and whoa, all of a sudden I hear Chris. <laughs> cool. All right, let's get back into it. So when we left, we were talking about tools that we can use as part of threat hunting. And one of them is ACE. 
AC Hunter Community Edition, which we will be using when we get into doing the labs in just a little bit. Uh, what's kind of cool about this tool is that when you get on the dashboard, the main screen, the left-hand side is going to be all your internal IP addresses ranked by threat score, meaning, hey, here are the IP addresses where we saw something we think you should pay attention to. On the right-hand side, we're going to go through and identify where did, those, where did that score come from? What's the breakdown? So for example, for this one highlighted here, 94.04 points were assigned, and 94 of those points was because there was a beacon signal identified. So I could, excuse me, click on the beacon score line, and that'll jump me into the beacon screen, and I'll see what is causing that score to go through and take place. There was another 0.404 points assigned because there was a connection running for two minutes. 10 seconds. Yeah, it's not very long. That's why it's only 0 0.04 points. The beacon screen. So over on the right-hand side, it's going to identify what data set are you looking at? What's the date time range? So um, when you set this up and you have Zeek feeding it logs, you'll get a um, you'll get a data set called rolling. Let me show you that real quick. So this one here. So the name is always going to be whatever the name is of the host. So if I have Zeke running at my perimeter and I name it Zeke system, whatever, uh, it will identify here as Zeke system dash rolling. Rolling means this is you, where you go to look for your last 24 hours worth of information. Um, Community edition doesn't save snapshots. Enterprise does. So with enterprise, I could go back seven days into the data if I needed to. Community edition only shows me my latest and greatest 24 hours. This is designed more to be a tool like, hey, I'm in trouble and I think I need help. This is a tool you can download and immediately start getting some results out of. But we've talked about a lot of what was on the screen earlier, and I'll get into it more as we start doing the labs. <clears throat> the beacon analysis on the bottom, like I said, that's always where my eyes go first. Anytime I'm looking at what might be a beacon, this is the first thing I always check is that graph on the bottom. And I'm looking for, you know, what we're showing here. Hey, if I draw an imaginary line, is everything about even with that line? If it is, yeah, that's connection persistency. That's something that's worth going in and paying attention to. Time interval count. So I talked about this. This is in that upper right-hand side. So this is... Let's get into a beacon here just so I can kind of show you. So this is how often I'm seeing certain time intervals. So in less than a second, we had 6,000 connections. Uh, or there was less than a second apart for 6,000 of the 20,000 connections. So this, I just let me back up. This I, internal IP was talking to that external IP. Over this 24-hour period of time, it made 20,000 connections. A little over 6,000 of them were less than a second apart. 7,000 of them were a second apart. And then it seems to kind of trail off a little bit after that. I've got two seconds, three, four, five, all the way up to 30 seconds. So it looks like maybe we, there was some latency on the network on occasion. So this is doing a time analysis of how often am I seeing a certain dwell time. If I go to view two, this is showing me session size. So notice out of my 20,054 connections, 20,053 of them were 52 bytes in size. That's my heartbeat. That's my, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. Out here, I have one connection at 104 bytes. So that tells me this C2 channel was activated once, and that resulted in about an additional 50 bytes of data traveling through it. 50 bytes isn't much. That's probably just checking, hey, does the C2 channel work? Can I actually get access to the console? We didn't, we probably didn't see any data transfer take place as part of this. Come on. There we go. So yeah, I just talked about this. So I mentioned that my biggest line is going to be my heartbeat. Do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. I mentioned you might sometimes see a smaller uh, number, a smaller number of connections take place that are down around the 40 byte range. Why is it 40 bytes? Well, by default, my IP header is 20 bytes in size. 
my TCP header with no options is, you guessed it, 20 bytes in size, thus my 40 bytes. So when I tried to connect, but it didn't work, that's going to be 40 bytes worth of data transfer here. So these are just failed connections. What I'm interested in is anything to the right of my heartbeat, because these are signs of activation. Out here, I'm probably at about 2,000 bytes. Okay, that means that I've got something going on here. C2 activation versus C2 heartbeat. So yeah, my heartbeat is just, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. Hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. Majority of my connections are typically gonna have no commands waiting in the queue. But when there is a command waiting in the queue, the size of that command plus the data that gets exfiltrated because of that command, right? So if I go in and I run task list, that's gonna be an extra eight bytes. But task list is gonna show all of the running tasks on that system. Well, that's going to be some other larger number than that, right? Probably a couple K. So it's the combination of the command and the data getting exfiltrated because of the command that identifies the full size of the session that we're seeing here. Target investigation, so I was showing you this. You know, it'll go through and show you what was being used for a protocol. If there was a DNS query that took place that resolved to this IP, what did that look like? Um, you may also have to, um, on occasion, mouse over things. Let me show you that real quick. So if I go to, let's say, Beacon Web, there's usually one here, right? So my subject line, notice it says CDN dot one node dot 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 five dots. The five dots tells me there's more data there. If I mouse over it, here's that full digital certificate that showed up. This server, so what IP address was associated with this fully qualified domain name? Well, this is showing me a single IP address, but if I mouse over it, notice there's a bunch of them. So this is actually cdn.onenote.net is actually a content delivery network with servers at each of these listed IP addresses. So when my system was calling out to cdn.onenote.net, it connected to each of these IP addresses, you know, at least once, probably more times. So this is what's going to give me full visibility as to what's going on. And I talked about you can open up the IP investigation menu by clicking on it. I showed you that a little bit earlier. That gives you a nice little drop down. Here's where I'm showing you the mouse over stuff. So the default may look at like this, but if I mouse over a section, I'll see the full data. So keep an eye out for those five dots that you see. Long connections, I talked about this. So close means the connection's finished or you pull this data in out of a PCAP file. But if I'm reading, if I'm in the rolling data set, I may see an open connection listed here on occasion. And then this will give me the um, cumulative time for not just one, but all connections originating from this IP going to that IP over the previous 24 hours. If I go to view two, it'll show me individual. Thread Intel. So Thread Intel, let me go back and show you that on the main screen here. So that's this section in here. And this is actually pretty neat. So I'm not a Thread Intel fan. Um, the reason for that is Thread Intel addresses a threat model that we don't really deal with anymore. Thread Intel was great when our attack vector was script kitties living in mommy's basement that want to own more computers on the internet than their buddy who's playing the on same online video game. So that way I can insult them and say something like your mother is a llama and I can have all of the systems that I control join that same IRC chat channel and make the same insult to that person, your mother is a llama. And then they may come back with some insult against my mom. And now we'll go through and add up who had the most number of systems join in. You know, you're laughing. I've watched attackers do this. <laughs> it used to be this stupid, this silly. So when that was the case, knowing an IP address attacked me or was acting as command and control for a system on, on, on my network could be beneficial to you because the attack model was mass propagation. That's not the goal today. The goal today is crime organizations. It's nation states. They're targeting you because there's something you have they want. 
There's some sort of resource you have that they want to go after specifically. So the malware they use against you, they're not going to use it anyplace else. That's why we can't use old, the old-fashioned signature-based malware anymore. That's why that doesn't work, because it's going to get changed up. Uh, nor can you count on the infrastructure staying the same. There's money involved. They're just going to move to a different cloud environment or whatever. So this whole concept of, you know, and, and what, what really ticks me off is there are major vendors, some of which I've already mentioned their names, that say they do threat intel, and this is all they do. They give you a ban list. Come on. No. This would have been fine 20 years ago. It's not fine now. This stuff changes up and moves around. So if you're using a threat intel list, you're probably seeing matches, but I can tell you where those matches are coming from. That IP address in EC2 was hostile three months ago. And then the attacker cycled the IP address back into the pool. It's been assigned to somebody else. It's now assigned to some legitimate website. Your user tried to go to that legitimate website and you stopped them because that IP address is on a ban list. So you think your tool is doing good because it got a match when the reality is, no, it's just triggering false positives and wasting your time. You're running down something that means nothing. So here's how we deal with threat intel. So there are two files. There's an IP, one for IP addresses, one for fully qualified domain names. And you can just append whatever you want into those files and we'll go check them. And if we get a match, we'll assign some small number of points like 10. But then what we do is we start watching how many bytes of data leaves your client and goes to that server. Because think of that false positive situation I just described. It was hostile at one point, now it's just some legitimate website. How much data we, would you expect to see your client send to that server? Not much, right? Let's take worst case, HTTPS. The client's going to send its SSL, SSL client hello, regardless of whether it's an SSL or TLS session. It's called an SSL client hello. So it's going to send its SSL client hello. It's going to send its user agent string. And it's going to send any URIs for any data it wants to request. That's it. It's not much. So what we do is when we see a match, we trigger 10 points just to let you know, hey, you saw a match. Then we start counting bytes. If it exceeds five megabytes, we start adding in points, additional points. So unless you see additional points being added in here, I wouldn't sweat this one at all. I would just ignore it. If it gets to 25 megabytes, we've added in 100 points at that point. Hey, you really need to pay attention to this. You actually got a positive hit off of this. So that's how Threat Intel works with ACE. And I described that for you down here. The Cyber Deception Module. This one's kind of cool. So what this allows you to do is set up tiny little tripwires in your environment. So for example, I could create a token and, and, the, and that token is just some sort of deception. So I could say, I want to create a token that is a user named John Doe, who is an administrator in my environment. And we'll spit out a PowerShell script for you that you then go run on your domain controller. And it will create the John Doe user. It will uh, assign them to be the, an administrator. And then we'll, it will also assign a randomized 32 character password. Well, it's 32 characters. That's not getting cracked in this lifetime by brute force, right? So that's an account that no one's going to be able to log into. So then we go in and we turn on full logging. Now, let's say I break into your environment. One of the things I might do to kind of find my way around is I might not enumerate all your user accounts and start trying common passwords against them. Let's see, it's March. So I'm going to try winter 2022 or winter 2023 or spring 2023, right? You know, when we're PCI forces us to change our password four times a year, that's what our users go for. What's the year? What's the season? That'll be my password for the next three months. And now I don't forget it because I know what the season is and I know what the year is. So it's going to go in and it's going to, um, they'll go in and they'll try variations of that against every single account. And then they'll come back and try it again and they go low and slow to make sure they don't trigger a lockout on anything. Well, John Doe is a user nobody uses. So as soon as it pops up and tells you, hey, 192.168.88.2 just tried to log in as John Doe. Oh, you've got a user who's gone rogue. Oh, you've got malware on that system. That's something you need to pay attention to because no one should be logging in as that. Uh, one of my favorite files is to create a file on your net login share 
that looks like an accounting login or, you know, a science login or, you know, why would someone come to your environment and try and steal things? Think about that and create what looks like a login script to match that specific group of people. And now what you do is uh, now what the tool does is it creates that file, turns on full monitoring, and you just don't assign it to anybody's profile. Well, it's on the net login share. Anybody can get to it, but the only people who read it is anyone who has it in their profile and nobody does. So no one should ever touch that file. Well, back in my pen testing days, when I got access to a system, the first thing I always did was make a copy of everything on the net login share. And I'd copy that down to the system I compromised. And now I could go through those login scripts and that would show me where all the resources are within the internal environment. That's where everything gets mapped out, right? Well, you've created a file that's not assigned to anybody's profile. No one should touch that. So the only thing that, you know, the, if somebody does touch it, again, rogue user, malware on the system, something to pay attention to. Now, the one thing that might touch it is your backup system, right? So if I go into my cyber deception, let's say I've got, here we go, this one here. This is my, so this is my script, <clears throat> but my backup system might back this up. See this little filter icon? If I click that, I can safe list that out. I can go in and say backup system is at that source IP address. So now this source IP address, if it reads that file, it isn't going to score points against it. It isn't going to give me something to pay attention to. But any other IP address that does, yeah, that's going to go through and that's going to grab that for me. So that's what safe listing does for me. Safe listing allows me to go through and say, here are exceptions to this rule, or this is something that I've looked at and there's a business need behind it. I have a business need to back up my files, right? My backup server is going to pull them down. If you see my backup server doing that, don't worry about it, not a big deal. Deep dive. So this one's kind of cool. So what deep dive allows me to do is it allows me to go in and do, you guessed it, a deep dive on things. So let's say I looked at this and I said, yeah, I don't know what's going on with this system. Let me look at it a little bit closer. If I click on the IP address, this little pop-up menu pops up and I'm gonna to go to the deep dive module. And the deep dive module is gonna show me all the connections this IP address made with the other side of the firewall, right? And everything's color coded. So anything that's in white, that's a way of saying, this didn't look suspicious to us. This looked like just normal user traffic, nothing to see here, nothing to worry about. Anything in orange, and some of these you might need to expand them out, right? See like 27, you could see with 27 dot something was dot dot orange. That's because two of them were okay, but one of them showed up as orange. That's where we're gonna go in and tell you, this looked a little weird to us. There's some persistency here. This might be something you need to check a little bit quick, uh, deeper. Now, in this screen, we're going to show you everything. Even if you've safe listed it, it will pop up on this screen. We're trying to give you a single spot where you can go in and kind of view everything that's going on with this host. So you can see a summary of what it did with the other side of the firewall. And I can go in and I can drill down on things. Now, imagine I did this, right? And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, uh, let me pick one. Um, yeah, we'll use this one. doesn't matter which one we pick. So let's say I'm looking at this and I'm saying, oh, I think my system's compromised and I think this is the command and control server, right? This is its heartbeat calling home. That one uh, doesn't really look like a heartbeat, but let, let's pretend there was more data there. Yeah, this, this looks a little suspicious, but I don't think it's enough to actually say this is a heartbeat. But let's say we had enough data here to show, yeah, this looks like it's a heartbeat. This looks like a command and control server. We said one of the first things we want to get a handle on is scope, right? We want to see, are any of my other systems talking to this IP address? How do I do that? Well, I have two choices. Back in the beacon menu, I could pick deep dive. Or while I'm here, I just click pivot. And pivot switches the view to that IP address out on the internet. Well, I can see this system is the only one talking to it. So if this system is compromised and that's its command and control server, this is the only box that's been whacked. What I tend to see a lot of times, unfortunately, is you pivot like that, and now you see 10, 12 other systems talking to it. And their communication interval is much slower. So the system you caught might have been calling home once every minute, but then you find a dozen other systems and they're calling home every eight hours or so. 
So now we know the scope of our incident response is all of these systems, not just this one. So that's one of the cool things you can go in and do a deep dive. The install process is pretty straightforward. So there's three ways to get uh, ACE. One is you've got it on the class VM. So you've already got a copy of it. Zeek is there. So if it can see Zeek traffic or if you want to import Zeek traffic in, um, you've got a copy of it all up and ready to go. Uh, Bill was kind enough to go through and create another VM that doesn't have the class files in it, but has more default databases on it. And that's running on a virtual machine already. So that's another way you could go grab this. The other way you could grab it is to grab the um, install script. So you download it, you open it up, in there is an install script. And when you run that, it just prompts you through the process. And notice it, it pops up and says, hey, do you want to install AC Hunter? Yes, I do. Where do you want to install it? If I install it on loopback, it assumes that it wants to I want to use the account I'm using. If I assign it a remote system, so I could pull this down to a Linux box and then install it someplace else, not on the box that I'm running this install script from, which is kind of cool. But if I install it on a remote system, it's going to ask me what credentials should I use? What's the login name? What's the password? Or if I have a digital, uh, if I have public private key set up, I can go in and use that. That way it won't prompt for a password. Notice it's also asking me, do you want to install Zeek? If I give it a different IP address, right? Let's say I send it to 192.168.1.10. I want to put Zeek on that system. When the install gets to the point of the process where it's going to install Zeek, it'll log into that IP address and it'll look to see is Zeek already there. If it isn't, we just go ahead and install it. And we do some really cool tuning to it. I highly recommend you let the tool install Zeek for you. Zeek can be kind of a PETA to try and install manually. So we go in and you know we fix things like that, You know, not seeing connections until they close. We fix that. Uh, the TCP timeout by default is set for five minutes. That's way too low. So we change the TCP timeout to be an hour. So there's a bunch of little tweaks we do to optimize performance and visibility and that type of thing. So we'll do the Zeek install for you. If you point at a system and we find Zeek is already there, we'll ask you, hey, do you want us to tune Zeek for you? And if you say yes, we'll go in and we'll do that tuning. If you say no, we'll say, okay, fine. We won't touch it. But since we're not touching it, you need to set up a way to have your Zeek logs automatically transfer to AC Hunter. If you let the install script do it, it'll do all that for you. Otherwise, you're going to have to go through and manually do that yourself. But notice it's also moving on saying, hey, do you want to install ActiveFlow? Do you want to install Beaker? If you go to our website, those are some of the other free tools that we offer. So this install script will install all of them if you want to be able to run everything. Uh, Beaker is what monitors what applications are talking on the network. Uh, ActiveFlow will take in data from like NetFlow and IPFix and stuff like that. Um, I don't recommend it because those tools give you horrible visibility and they're prone to dropping traffic and you don't get to see everything. Uh, Zeek is really the way to go. If, if I'm in a situation where I've got like a remote field office, there's five users there, there's no one to manage anything. And I've, and I've got hardware on site that runs NetFlow. All right. It's better than nothing. In that case, I would just go ahead and use NetFlow. But if I have a choice, I'm going to want to go through and use Zeek. Uh, you could also install SB. I didn't show it on the screen, but SB allows you to monitor for beacons on systems not on your network. So you could have Sysmon running on a home user system, and we'll go through and check to see, hey, is there anything that looks like C2 traffic leaving that system? Another cool tool is data mesh. So there'll be times that we want to go through and uh, let's see, we got a question. Can you run the install Zeek script for a different machine later on after you've already installed ACH? Great question. Yes, you can. So when I go in and do the install, what I would do is simply when I'm ready to install Zeek, run this script again. And when it says, do you want to install AC Hunter? No. Do you want to install Zeek? Yes. Okay. Where do you want me to put it? And you're probably going to have to tell it where the AC Hunter is, system is so it knows where to go through and send the log entries. Good question. Chris? Yes. Hey, quick question. Um, I, I, I should know the answer to this. I don't. 
Uh, we know Zeek will provide IPv6 information. Are there parts of AC Hunter that support IPv6 and others that don't? I can't remember the answer to that. No, the, uh, everything supports IPv6. Beautiful. Thank you very much. It just looks at it as yet another dress, but one that takes up more, more space. <laughs> so you, so you'll it. probably end up having to use the mouse over feature more often. <laughs> okay, thanks. Can you use a delimited list of IP addresses for installing Zeek with the script? That is a great question, Plastic Axe. Uh, if it doesn't have that ability, I'll let Bill answer that in the channel because Bill maintains that script. If it doesn't have that ability, I'll bet you could like bribe him into it. <laughs> Let's see, a setup with Zeek deployed with Security Onion. Okay, so I like Security Onion. I think it's a great contribution to the community. I don't like using Security Onion in an enterprise environment because I've just found it to be very brittle. Uh, I actually used to teach a class on Security Onion and I stopped mostly because of all the problems we had getting Security Onion to run consistently. So with all of that said, yes, if you have Security Onion running, and you want to pull the Zeek logs off of that and pull that into AC Hunter, absolutely you can go through and do that. Um, we don't support the community edition through our regular support channels. There's a Discord channel for that on the server. Um, but even with like our enterprise users, we'll support Zeek if we install it. We won't support Security Onion. We'll, 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 we'll try and help you if we can. It's not like we're going to say, hey, F you, you're running Security Onion. Ha, ah, sucks to be you. No, we're not going to do that. But we'll try to help you. But if it doesn't work, you, you got to kind of figure that out. Uh, let's see. How do you forward those Zeek logs? So if you have the install script take care of it for you, uh, we use SSH with public private keys. And it creates a special user called, and Bill, please correct me because I'm sure I'll get this wrong. It's like the data something user. Uh, actually, I know I get it wrong because I can't remember the name. But it's data something user gets created. And we just set up public private keys for that. And we use SSH data import. Thank you, Bill. And we'll go through and we'll use that for the transfer. Will Zeke take next NetFlow export data? No, it will not. But that active flow utility converts NetFlow into Zeke log format as best it can. What do I mean as best it can? NetFlow is freaking horrible from a security standpoint. I, you know, NetFlow is one of those things that we kind of say, well, it's there, let's use it. And it sounds good, but the visibility with it is horrible. Some of the problems I've run into NetFlow, uh, sampling, it just ignores traffic because it's too busy at the time. You know, it, when you look at the devices that run NetFlow, NetFlow is a, you know, secondary or worse function. If the CPU gets busy, that's always the first thing it stops doing. So you always end up blind to certain things go, taking place on the network. Um, so sampling becomes a problem. You don't see everything. Some of the standards are a little bit too loose. We've run into devices that when it records a time in NetFlow of that session, it means different things. Sometimes it's when the session started. Sometimes it's when the session finished. Sometimes it's when the NetFlow entry was actually created. So you end up with different things, logging time the different ways. So when you're trying to identify beacons and accuracy of time matters, NetFlow drives you nuts. Oh my God. I had to like, you know, help my engineers from having a drinking problem from trying to create the converter for that thing because it was so frustrating for them. Uh, you run into other problems too, like no data visibility. So for example, I was talking about, uh, well, let, let me show you. So if I go in here, what did I do wrong? There we go. So this tells me the user was trying to get to cdn.onenote.net when they went to these IP addresses. That's super helpful information, right? If we're a Microsoft Office shop, I know this is okay. This is just people using the office suite that we bought for them. This is okay. This is a feature. If I'm using NetFlow or IPFix, all I'm seeing is connections to these IP addresses. Now I need to kind of run them down to figure out why was the user trying to go here? Who uses that? So can you use NetFlow? Yes, you can. If it's your only choice, if you have any choice at all, please use Zeek. 
Um, if it's a hardware thing, Bill did an awesome, awesome webcast on uh, enterprise grade hardware that runs the equivalent of a Raspberry Pi that'll only run you a couple hundred bucks that'll keep up with almost a gig worth of traffic going by. Um, you really want to avoid inflow if you can. All right. So let's change gears off AC, uh, off ACE for a minute. Now I have a couple more tools I want to talk about before we jump into doing the labs. The first is data mash. This is a cool tool. And I honestly feel like data mash is like underserved because data mash can, it, when you're working with the command line and you're manipulating data, this is a tool that can do things that'll just like really bail you out. I'll give you an example. Let's say I'm going through Zeek logs and I want to look at how long were connections running for between two different systems. Well, Zeek logs duration. So I can see the duration of every specific connection that took place. But what if there were multiple connections from my internal system to that host on the internet? Well, now I want to look at cumulative time. Well, normally what I might have to do is just look at all of, you know, print those out pull them into a spreadsheet, right? And then add up that third column to figure out what the total duration is or look at all the numbers and ballpark it or have a calculator handy. With Data Mash, Data Mash will do that addition for me. It'll also tell me what's the min, the max, the mean, the average of those numbers. Um, you can do some cool, excuse me, you can do some cool stuff with it. So let me give you an example. So here I've said cat con.log. So normally that would just spit out all the contents of con.log, but then I pumped it through Zcut and I said, I want to print out the source IP address, the destination IP address, and the duration of the connection. And you see that here. Here are my source IPs, my destination IPs, and the duration of the connection. Then I ran it through sort and I said sort dash K3. Normally sort will start sto sorting in this first uh, character here. I'm telling it, no, I have columns and I want to start on the third column. What I'm trying to do is sort by the duration, not by based on IP address information. And I'm saying dash RN, these are not handle this like a number, not like an alphanumeric value and reverse sort means print out biggest to smallest. So this is just going to go through and sort based on duration and show me my longest duration connections first. And then I just said, hey, print out five lines. So here's my longest duration connection that was in that con.log file. And then here are the next four after that. Well, you notice I've got some duplicates, right? Dot 104, dot, 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 uh, dot 11. That's just twice that same system connected to that same target IP. I'll talk about the grep statements in just a second, but let me get through data mash first. With data mash, I can go in and say, hey, this output, when column one and column two are the same, in other words, when the source and destination IP address match, sum or add up the value in the third column. So rather than seeing, you know, 41.8 seconds here, 31.4 seconds here, it added it up for me. Awesome. This is a great time saver, right? So data mash will do some really cool stuff like that. Now, what are these grep statements here? <clears throat> Data mash only wants numbers, right? It, it manipulates numbers. It only wants to see numeric values. When Zeke sees a connection that the SIN packet connected, but the connection was killed, meaning no data was transferred, it didn't even complete the three packet handshake, Zeke will log that as a dash, the minus sign. Well, data mash doesn't know what to do with that. So if it sees that, it just pukes out with an error message and stops processing. So this grep command says, hey, any lines, dash V, any lines, show me all lines except for the ones that have a dash symbol in them. And now that'll filter that data out of my output so that data mash isn't going to puke on it. Um, sometimes I'll get a blank line in my output. This grep command here says, show me everything but blank lines. But data mash is going through and doing the addition for me, which is pretty cool. Mm. Now, one of the things we're going to want to do is test our setups, right? Right. Like today, you might be asking yourself, huh, I wonder if someone, if we could detect a beacon, if an internal system got compromised 
and we're and you know it starts beaconing out to the internet would anything detect that um <laughs> we had a really cool customer come in a couple of years ago where uh you know we went through and we kind of showed him what ac hunter looked like and you know the guy was like i know we need this tool i know i'm going to get pushed back from the sim group the sim group is going to say no we can detect this stuff we don't need this tool so it may take me a little bit to get a po sign because i'm going to have to mess with them and what he did was he set up a beacon from an internal system he went in and he set up um you know i don't know some 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 compromise tool you know he i, I can't remember the ones he used gcat whatever it was he went in and, and ran some of that software so that it was a beacon signal going out to the internet and he let it run for like three days and nobody flagged it. So he said, hey, we need this AC Hunter tool because I ran this software on this system. This was indicative of a compromised system. It wasn't detected. We need to be able to detect this stuff consistently. And the SIM team came back and said, oh, don't worry about it. We wrote a rule, we'll catch it all the time now. So then he went to a different tool like VS Agent <laughs> and he ran that and let it run for three days. Hey, I ran another C2 channel. Nobody flagged it. We need these. He did that to them five times before they finally gave up and said, okay, fine, buy your freaking tool. And, you know, they got it deployed and was able to go through and kind of detect things from there. So being able to go in and set up something that looks like a beacon. Now he was actually installing malware. I don't recommend that. This tool here, the threat simulator will create what looks like a beacon signal, but it can actually be used as a C2 channel. So for example, you know, if you read the connect to TCP 80 every 300 seconds, plus or minus 10 per second, 10 seconds, that is a, that's a beacon that's jittering, right? And, you know, you could even go in and vary the payload if you want to go in and do that with this too. It won't exfiltrate any data. No one could ever actually use this as a real C2 channel but it will do a damn good job of going in and simulating one for you. So if you're trying to get threat hunting going in your environment and you're trying to help justify it, this tool or one like it may kind of help you be able to kind of push that along. And yeah, this is another free tool we offer. Go up to our website, you can download it, use it for free. Now, <clears throat> threat simulator doesn't put anything in the payload. Well, you could write an easy script to go through and do that. So here I've written a script called beacon test, and it's just a couple of lines. So beacon test says while, so I'm setting up my loop here. This is what I want you to do. I want you to run the curl command. I want you to change the user agent string to be modzilla version 0. 0.0001. Wow, that's a real early version of modzilla, right? Running on an Atari 7800 because we all remember the web server cartridge, right? Sometimes you couldn't connect to the web server, so you had to pull the cartridge out and you know clean the contacts with an eraser and put it back in. No, Atari didn't run a <laughs> didn't run an IP stack. This is clearly you know a joke. This is one I like to use just to see if people pick up on it. But then it's got dollar sign one. So what dollar sign one does is it allows me to run beacon test space and IP address. And this will have curl start connecting to that IP address. This just says anything you'd normally print to the screen, throw it away. I don't want to see it. And then once it uses curl to connect to that web server, then it will go to this line. And this line says, I want you to sleep. And I want you to sleep for a set of time for a for number of seconds defined by this statement here. Shuff is a randomization tool. And honestly, my personal feeling is it's more random than random. I get better random results out of shuff than I do out of the random function, as weird as that sounds. And what I'm telling it here, and it also has some really useful switches to it too. So here I'm telling it, I want to randomly pick a whole number between 200 and 350 and dash N1, I only want to pick one value and then feed that to sleep. So let's say shuff happens to pick 278. Well, it'll feed that to sleep. So sleep knows sleep for 278 seconds. And after 278 seconds, it goes to done, jumps to the top, and this will just keep running as long as you have it running for. So this just will create that beacon and keep it running until you actually kill it. Now, one of the things I like to do is run it, and this was Bill Stern's teaching me this, 
I run it with the screen command. And what's nice about doing it with the screen command is I can SSH into a system, run beacon test with this command, and then just disconnect from the SSH session and it will continue to run in the background. It isn't gonna die just because my SSH session ends. It will continue to run in the background. And now I can SSH back to the box later and use SSH to reconnect to this session that I named C2 to see what the output looks like or kill it or do whatever I want with it. So writing your own scripts can be a really helpful threat hunting tool as well. So yeah, creating your own scripts. This is one we go through in the advanced class. So what we do is in, I walk folks through the, in the advanced class through actually creating a script. We create a script named FQ. And what FQ does is it prints out a banner that says DNS info, and then it checks the Zeek logs for an IP address, a fully qualified domain name that you specify. And it checks all the Zeek logs for it to see if there's any DNS information about it. So here I said, FQ this IP address. It went through all the DNS logs and found out, oh, hey, somebody query this fully qualified domain name and went, oh, excuse me, this fully qualified domain name. And when they did, this is what came back. The C name came back and this IP address came back. And then it'll check the HTTP logs and the SSL TLS logs for that same piece of information. So if there was an HTTP connection, I'd see the host parameter get identified. Notice there wasn't an HTTP connection. There was a TLS connection. So this was what was in the uh, SNI information here, which matches what they queried. And this is telling me it had a valid digital certificate. So did the user get to where they wanted to go? Yeah, it looks like they did. Is it okay for them to access adsafeprotected.com? Uh, maybe not. That may not be one of the sites we want people connecting to. So that may be something I wanna go through and take steps to. But you can see just by writing up the simple quit. Now I could have just grepped that IP address every single time, right? But this just makes it so much easier to go through and do and gives me a nice, easy to read output. If scripting sounds interesting to you, and it's something you wanna learn more about, Bill's actually working on an anti-siphon on-demand class to go through and teach you scripting. I highly recommend attending that class. I have learned so much about script. I've been lucky enough to be able to be friends with Bill for over 20 years now, and I have learned a ton from him. So funny Bill story since we're coming up at the top of the break anyway. So I've known Bill for over 20 years. Uh, for a while, we shared an office. One of the things I used to have in the office was a whiteboard where I wrote down any time I was able to teach Bill something about Linux that he didn't already know. And I don't think I ever made it to 10 items over the last 20 years. <laughs> That's how much Bill knows what he's doing. So his scripting class, uh, I actually plan, shh, don't tell Bill, but I actually plan on sitting in on that as well. All right, tell you what we're gonna do. I am gonna set this up and then um, we'll take a 20 minute break because we're at the halfway point. And then when we come back, we'll start jumping into doing some of the hands-on walkthroughs. And in that way, if you haven't got your VM up and running yet, it gives you a little bit more time to go through and do that. But I'm just gonna hit a couple of slides and then we're gonna go off and take a break after that. So this section is gonna be two different types of things. It's either gonna be, be walkthroughs or labs. Walkthrough means I'm going to do something and you're going to follow along on your system. So for example, you've never, had to, you've never tried to import data into AC Hunter before, I'm guessing. I'm gonna walk you through that. I will do it on the screen while you do it too. That way we make sure that you actually get it done right. So you don't have to worry about it. Labs are going to be, here's a problem. See if you can solve it. Now, what I've done with the walkthroughs is the slides will kind of match what I'm doing on my screen. So you have something to refer back to later if you need it. With the labs, I'm gonna give you a problem. If you look at the lab problem, and you think you know the answer and you can solve it, jump in and do it. If you read the problem and you're like, Chris, I kind of know what you're talking about, but I really don't know where to begin to try and crack that nut. The next slide after the lab slide will always be a hint slide. And the hint slide 
will get you pointed in the general direction. It isn't going to give you the answer, but you know, it's it's kind of that, hey, you know, we're we're going to trek out from here and the hint slide might say, you know, you might want to try going north. It isn't going to tell you where to end up, <laughs> but it's going to at least tell you, you know, this is the general direction that you want to go in from here. So, some reminder information. If you're logging in to, uh, if you're logging in VSSH, if you get remote access to your system, the login name is threat, the password is hunting. When you log in AC Hunter, the login name is threat at activecountermeasures.com. The password is hunting too. If you're working in the VM itself, you don't have to worry about this. The SSH stuff. All you got to do is just click the terminal and you'll be off and ready to go from there. And if you're not sure, you know, which one's the terminal. So I'm going to type in hunting because that's just my regular threat account password. That'll get me into here. This is your terminal right here. So if I click that, that's going to get me down to my command line. And I don't have to log anything in because I'm working within the VM. When you launch Chrome and you're going to log in here for the first time, you may have to type in credentials. And the credentials for that are threadedactivecountermeasures.com, password hunting too. <clears throat> VM access, I talked about this a little bit earlier. So if I want to access that system from my host system, if I'm running VMware, I simply point my browser at the IP address that's been assigned to that VM. If I'm using VirtualBox, I've got to set up port forwarding first and I shared a link a little bit earlier on that. Um, here, I'll show you what that is. And I'll share this link in the chat. So if you go to blogs, I just did a blog on this. Technically, I wrote the blog up for something else. And Shelby said, hey, I'm going to steal that and make a blog out of it. So that was cool. <laughs> Can we doodle around in the terminal beyond the labs? Will the VM self-destruct? No, you can play around if you want to. That's fine. Uh, if you think you might do something destructive, I would make a copy of that VM before you do something so destructive that your only recourse is to re-download the VM all over again. You may want to make a copy before you go down that road. But if you're working on VirtualBox, here's how to go through and set up port forwarding on that. That's right up there on the website. And again, I shared that in the Discord channel. Also, keep in mind, you're going to get this not secure. It's because uh, ACE is using a self-signed cert by default. That's easy enough to fix if you want to put a real cert on that system. VirtualBox port forwarding, I talked about that. And this is where to find your lab files. So when you log in via SSH, you log in from the terminal, you're going to be in the home directory, right? Let me bring you back there. So when you first drop in, you will be here. Thread at ACH. Where am I? Well, if I type in PWD, that'll tell me where I am. I'm in the home directory of the threat user. If I type LS, that's going to list all the directories and files that I can see from this location. The one I'm interested in, this one right here, labs. If I say CD space LAB and then just hit tab to autocomplete and hit enter, is a lab one, two, and three directory. So we'll start in lab one, we'll move to lab two, and then we'll move to lab three. Pretty easy to get in and navigate around. Yeah, so the login, I talked about that. When you first log in, you have to select a database. Select the DNS cat 2 j 3 stroke. It really doesn't matter which one you select. You got to select something, might as well be that one. That way we're all on the same page. <clears throat> and then once you log in, this is what you should see. You should see these IPs, this score. So if you want to get in and kind of poke around a little bit, you can. If you see this <laughs> where everything's kind of squished up, you've got two options. One is run the browser on your home's host system. That won't have this problem, right? This is only happening because I'm in a tiny little VM. I was showing you that earlier with mine where yeah, everything's kind of squished up. So with VirtualBox, I could go in and I could change my view to either full screen or scale mode. 
and that would allow me to make this screen bigger and that would allow more real estate for the screen. Um, I could also go in and click the little dots and say, I want to zoom out some, and that'll unsquish things a little bit. Uh, running the browser off your home system is probably the easiest way to solve this problem, but that's totally up to you. You know, like I said, you can scale it out and just zoom out a little bit and everything will look fine. So you should see something that looks like this. Look at the spacing. If you see something all mushed together like that and the words run in together, yeah, you got to scale things out a little bit. <clears throat> and tell you what, with that said, let's stop here. So it's now the top of the hour. We're going to take a 20 minute break this time <clears throat> and then we'll pick up from where we are and we'll keep going from here. So um, yeah, 20 minutes after the top of the hour, we'll start back up. I'm going to go on mute. Uh, that way, everybody gets some uh, quiet time to go off and do their thing. And I promise not to come back loud this time. I'll catch you all in 20 minutes. Okay, we're back. <clears throat> I didn't want to do that too loud. Hopefully, I didn't blow anybody's eardrums out. So we're back, and I'm going to start talking now. Uh, let's continue with our hands-on walkthrough. All right. <clears throat> so hopefully you get the VM running. Hopefully you're in a web browser. Hopefully you're logged into um, act, uh, uh, Ace, Ace, Ace. Yeah, let's call it Ace. It's easier. Uh, hopefully you logged into Ace. What I want you to do is go to settings and make sure you get the DNS cat 2 ja 3 strobe database selected. Once you do, click confirm and you'll see the screen reload regardless of whether you have that database set or not. And what I'm going to do is um, we're going to go through and we're going to, I'm going to walk you through how do you create a safe list entry? Because we've talked about that a lot. Um, I want to go through and, and just show you an example of that. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Beacon's Web. Right, this this uh, module down here, this little icon. Click on that, you'll see the re screen reload, and you'll get something like this. Then what I want you to do is to go to the second entry on this list, ten fifty five one eighty two one hundred, and just click that. And when you do, you'll see the data reload. So if we look at what we've got here, we've got an internal system talking to a host out on the internet, and sometimes it's doing two connections an hour, sometimes it's doing one connection an hour. But you can see we're getting constant connectivity all day long. That's why we're looking at this and we're saying, hey, this is a beacon. This is something you should pay attention to. Now, if I look at the data on the top right on what was going on, you'll probably recognize the fully qualified domain name, right? They were trying to get to this user was trying to get to config.edge.skype.com. Well, that just means that it was somebody using Skype. Now, let's further assume that in our environment, Skype is what we use for doing virtual meetings. So this is a, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this is a, a business application that is acceptable to go through and use. We can see that the subject matches, uh, is it an invalid certificate? No. So that means the certificate checked out. So the user queried a fully qualified domain name got back an IP address, connected to that IP address, that system identified itself using that same fully qualified domain name with a valid digital certificate. So that tells me, yeah, this is the skype.com that we think it is. Now, we don't wanna see this anymore, right? We've identified this is a business need. Any of my users might connect to that site and that's perfectly fine. So what we wanna do is we wanna create a safe list entry for this. Anytime we want to create a safe list entry, we want to click on this little filter icon. You see my mouse pointer over right here. So again, follow along with me here. Click the little filter icon and you'll get a little pop-up screen like this. Now, what options are available for creating this depends upon what screen we're in at the time. Since we're working with a fully qualified domain name here, we can go in and we can safe list for a fully qualified domain name. So the first thing we need to identify is what internal host do we want to safe list? We could say only this IP address is allowed to talk to this system. Or we could say just this classy subnet. We're gonna say all internal systems. Any of my internal users who wanna use Skype, that's perfectly fine, I'm not gonna worry about that. <clears throat> then what I'm gonna do 
is I'm going to say, okay, select an A record to resolve. Well, there's only one here, right? If I go into that Skype address. And I want you to click this little slider here, enable wildcard. What does that do for me? What that does for me is that allows me to say, right now they could go to config.edge.skype.com and we would safe list that out. But what if we want to let them get to anything edge.skype.com? Or we could even say star.skype.com if we wanted to do that. Let's just, for the sake of argument, set it to Skype or set it to Edge, right? So your little slider here should be in the middle. So now anything at edge.skype.com, we're going to safe list that. And then we're going to put in a comment as to why we're safe listing it. So I'm going to say, um, you know, Skype traffic is a okay. Oh, no special characters. I can't use I can't use an exclamation point. Um, created by C. Brenton on twenty twenty three. Uh, what's the date today? Oh three oh seven. So now. I know why the why was this safe list entry created because it was identified as Skype traffic. Who created it? When did they create it? Now watch the screen in the background when I click safe list. Notice the screen update goes by. It says safe listing in progress. So this is taking a bit because I got a lot going on in my system. We still see in config.edge.skype.com. But once that goes away, notice that entry went away. I don't see that anymore. And if I go back to my dashboard and go to settings and go to safe list, I have a button up here called view edit. Notice now I have, this shows me a number one that tells me I've got a safe list entry in there already. And, and with the community edition, I can have up to 50. With the enterprise version, it's unlimited. You can have as many as you want. But I'm gonna click this view edit button. When I click view edit, you can see here's my entry here, star.edge.skype.com. It's a domain pattern. That's just saying, yeah, I'm matching on the fully qualified domain name. Here's my comment. And the action is identifying, you know, I could go in and change the comment on it if I wanted to. I could delete this one entry if I wanted. If I had a bunch of them in here, I can do searches for different types, different scopes, you know, so if I've got, you know, 30 entries in here and there's one in particular I want to look for, that'll help me whittle down that list so I can go in and I can find it that much quicker. But I'm just going to hit close and confirm. And like I said, now that dot 100 entry is gone. There's one down here, but that's going someplace else. That's going to msn.com. So I may then want to go back in and make a safe list entry for that, but you get the idea. <laughs> So that's how we go through and we create safe list entries. So when we do a hunt and we identify something that is interesting to us, uh, or excuse me, when we do a hunt, we identify something that there's a business need associated with it. We safe list it. So now that does not show up in our data anymore. It doesn't delete it. It doesn't delete that data. If I remove the safe list entry, everything comes back but it gets it out of my way so I don't have to worry about it anymore. Uh, let's see. DNS cat JA3 strobe does not have that entry. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. Go to settings, go to safe list, look at the delete all button. After you create this entry, it should only list the number one. If you see the number five, I need you to do a delete all, and then you can go through and do what I did. On uh, the VMware instances, I neglected to delete the safe list once I was done running through all the labs to make sure everything worked properly. So that was my oopsie that I needed you to fix. We went through and did it at the beginning. Some of you may have come in late, but just click delete all, and this will say, warning, you're going to remove everything. Yes, I want to remove everything. And now when you go to Beacon Web, you should see that entry is the second one on the list. Once you do that, click the little filter icon, wildcard, edge, comment, safe list, 
and then bang, you'll see once the safe list update is in progress finishes, that'll go through, delete the data. And now if you've done everything right, you should see the number one underneath the delete all. That's probably what you're running into there. All right, let's play around with something else here. So 192.168.88.2. When I look at the highest score here, it's coming in from a beacon. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this line where it says beacon score, and that's going to allow me to go in and investigate that. So here is the top scoring beacon that I'm seeing from that system. Now, let's say I'm looking at this and I'm saying, yeah, I don't know what this is, right? UDP 123, um, Zeek by default doesn't understand NTP. So that's why it's not showing me NTP. I'm not sure how they missed that one, but actually I should add one for that. <clears throat> That's something for me to do in all my proverbial free time. But I'm going to go in and I'm going to say, I don't, I want to learn a little bit more about this. So uh, let's go in and let's first go in and look at deep dive, right? So I can go into deep dive and see what's going on. You know, is anybody else talking to that external IP address as well? So that's one of the things I could go in and take a look at to see, you know, do I have multiple systems going in and talking to this or not? Um, I could then go in, and you saw me do this earlier, I'm going to click on this IP address, my internal, and once I do, you'll see a little P show up here, and then I can click that to pivot, switch the view, so now I'm looking at all the traffic that's going on with the internal system. So that'll allow me to kind of switch back and forth between the source and the destination. And again, follow along with me here, just so you can get used to using the tool. Now I'm going to go back to dashboard. Let's go back under that beacon score again. So let's say I looked at deep dive and deep dive didn't really help me that much. So now I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna launch virus total and I'll see a new tab open up and virus total is gonna show me, oh, that's consistently been part of ntp.org. I don't see anything with it that looks bad. We mentioned some stuff detected it, but we said some malware likes to check the time so it goes out and talks to these time servers, but that doesn't mean the time servers are malware. Uh, sometimes people get their, get their stuff crossed, right? This is just a legitimate time server. Anybody can use it. It's just sometimes it happens to get used by malware. So I'm looking at that and I'm saying, yeah, this looks like it's actually okay. <clears throat> so I could go through and say, um, you know, I want to create a safe list entry for that. We'll skip that for now, but I could go in and safe list if I wanted to. But I want to kind of walk you around the screens just a little bit more first before we go in and do that. So the next thing we'll go in and we'll take a look at, uh, this is what I'm seeing right now. Yep, that's the database, dude. So if you click one below database where it says safe list and then go look for that button on the bottom. So again, if I'm settings, you said this is what you're seeing and that's awesome. Now click where it says the word safe list. And when you do, look for this button down here. If it says the number one, you're good. If it says the number five, you need to delete all, and then you can go in and add one in. <clears throat> uh, let's see, someone says they can't see my screen. Is anybody else having trouble seeing my screen? Just out of curiosity, just a quick yes or no in Discord if you don't mind. I can see I it. I see it. That's fine here. Perfect. I can okay. See it. Okay. Awesome. Good to hear. <clears throat> All right. So I'm going to come pull out of that. All right. So let's take a look at long connections now. So we talked about this one a little bit earlier. So this is my internal system. It's talking to some host out on the internet. I'll talk about, I'll come back and talk about this in a second. Is the connection currently closed or open? And we said, if we read it out of PCAP, it'll always be closed. But if I'm looking at that running data set, I may see open connections in here on occasion, which means that's a connection that's still active at the time. These are no longer active, but I might see some that are active. How many bytes got transferred? How long has it been running for? Now, let's talk about this a little bit, because notice sometimes it's going to TCP 443 and it knows it's an SSL session. Sometimes it does not. And this is something you'll commonly run into in when you're working with uh, long connections. Zeek needs to see the initial handshake 
to know if this is uh, to know what application was being used. So this started 24 hours ago, right? What if the connection started before this data started? In other words, maybe the data goes back 24 hours, but the connection might go back 28 hours. Well, that means it started four hours before this data even started getting collected. That meant four hours before this data collection started, that's when the handshake went by. That's why it might not be able to identify it. So if I'm in the beacon screen and it can't identify the application, I get nervous. If I'm in the long connection screen and it can't identify what the application is and it's running for, you know, it's been running for about 24 hours, I worry about it a whole lot less. Notice once we get down to shorter time intervals, we start seeing that application layer being identified. So that puts us in pretty good shape there. All right, let's, let's play around and let's do an actual lab. So here's what we're gonna do. To do the lab, I'm gonna have you import the data. So let me show you a little cheat code that we don't necessarily advertise a lot. Rita is in the back end. If I say Rita-H, it's gonna prompt me for my password. My password is hunting. And notice I get my help screen for Rita. If I say Rita space list, there's all the databases I have loaded right there. So AC Hunter is basically a graphical front end for Rita. Why do we do it that way? We do it that way to make sure that Rita was always as accurate at finding command and control as AC Hunter is. AC Hunter classically has been our commercial solution, right? The community edition is new. But prior to that, that was our enterprise version. Um, it's easy to kind of get hyper-focused on the version that makes money and pays people's paychecks and forget about the open source ones. And we wanted to make sure that never happened. So we have Reader in the back end. So one of the things that allows us to do is to go through and use Rita to import databases into AC Hunter. So here's what I'm going to do. Right now, I am in the Home Threat Labs directory. If you're not there, CD to that spot right now. So if you're if you're right in the uh, Home directory, if you're under Home Threat, if you type in PWD, that'll tell you where you are. Then I can type in Labs, and then I want to go to the Lab One directory. So you want to be right here, Home Threat Labs, Lab One. Once you've CD'd into that directory, I can type LS and that'll show me files. And you'll notice I have a bunch of these files that have a .log extension to them. These are Zeek files. Remember we looked at con.log a little bit earlier? These are all my Zeek files. Now I wanna import these Zeek logs into AC Hunter. How do I do that? The command is Rita, and I'll copy paste this into the uh, to, into the Discord channel to make sure everybody's got it. So I'm going to type in Rita. I want to run the Rita command. Then I'm going to say import Yep, spelling matters, Chris. <laughs> Rita import. So I'm going to so I'm telling Rita I'm going to want to import some data. The data I want to import is star.log. So the log files in my current directory, that's what I want to import into Rita. And then I have to tell Rita, what do you want to name this? So I'm going to name it lab one, just because, hey, we're in the lab one directory. <clears throat> that's all I need to do. All right, so before I run this, let me copy it. Oh, SSH, I hate it when you flip the screen up and down. Paste that in. Okay, so I just pasted it into Discord. So you can just copy paste what I just uh, uh, put into Discord. And now when you run it, you're going to see that data getting imported. So notice what's coming back here. It's telling you, hey, I parsed these log files. I found 111.10 hosts. I found 110 unique connections. I didn't find any proxy data. So now I know, okay, there's no proxy data that needs to be reviewed. One of my screen, one of my modules is proxy beacons. <clears throat> this one right here, right? But 
when I did the import, it told me there wasn't any proxies to analyze. Cool. I know I don't have to worry about that screen. It tells me SNI data, beacon data, how many user agents were found, and then done. So once we hit done, we know, hey, we're done. So now if the magic has worked properly, I should be able to come up here to settings. So click on that. And under my databases, oh, hey, look at this. I got a lab one directory now, or excuse me, a lab one data set. So I just went through and imported that. Uh, let's see, Malfro is saying, I'm trying to change directories to labs, lab one, but it's giving me no such directory or file name. I can help you out, dude. Give me just a second here. And Chris, while you're looking at that, uh, we've had requests to, um, they're having a little trouble watching the bottom line of the screen. Can you take your terminal and just make it not full screen? Maybe uh, move the bottom line up a, a little bit? I oh, absolutely. It's getting cover covered by uh, the Zoom menus or something like that. Okay. Yep. I will, uh, <clears throat> I will keep it scaled. I will keep it scaled. So I just posted a command in a Discord, CD space forward, slash, and I gave the absolute path to the lab one directory, copy, paste that command, and it will take you there from anywhere. So if I go back to, you know, let's say the first directory when I came in, if I just take that command, copy it, paste it, it'll immediately dump me into that log one directory. Now, once I'm there, now I want to run this read import command. This is in the slides, by the way. So, you know, don't worry about like having to frantically write down what I'm typing and stuff like that. They're in the slides. I'm just pasting it into Discord so it's easier to see and you don't have to flip through slides while we're going through and we're doing this stuff. <clears throat> but all that stuff is there right there for you. So you should be good. But yeah, once it says done, it's done. And now if I go back here, like I said, just to kind of remind you where I was. So I went to settings, the little gear icon, databases, select lab one. And now if I hit confirm, it loads up that data set for me. <clears throat> so now I've got that lab one data lo loaded. So that should be all set to go. So here's what I want you to do. Uh, let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. Uh, let's see, we talked about changing databases. Yep, we created a safe list entry. So see, I have all this in here for you. Yep, this is something that's okay because it's Skype. We created a safe list entry. Once we did, we gave the same safe listing in progress. Then once that updated, that entry will go through and get removed. I mentioned this down here. If you see five, delete them and then go in and add this one in. This should say one at this point. I got to update that screen. Let me write that down. Okay. Already got slide to fixes, <laughs> slides to fix. Oh joy. And yeah, you'll have that one entry in there. Uh, let's see. Yep, we did beacon score. We looked at that. We used uh, virus, uh, deep dive. We played with that. We did a pivot. Um, I remember we did that. Yep, we looked at that. We looked at virus total. So we've gone through all of these already. Oh, notice virus total updated. It When I made these slides like a week ago, it was one source was flagging it, but they went through and investigated it and said, yeah, no, this is wrong and cleared that. So now when you look at virus totals, virus total says, yeah, no, this thing's fine. Don't worry about it. Uh, we looked at long connections. We talked about this module. <clears throat> um, oh, clear search. What was that for? So if I go, if I'm on my dashboard and I pick long connections here, see what it does here? It changes my filter criteria to be just that IP address I was currently investigating on the dashboard. So I won't see anything else but that entry. I can go in and I can do searches for different things. So if I say, I wanna see everything that is in the 192.168 network and hit enter, it's gonna go through and show those up for me. Um, I think 1055 is another network. No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> Oh, that's right, because I'm in a different data set. 
um, in a different data set. Let me go back to DNA. You don't have to follow me on this one. I'm just looking for, uh, yeah, I've got 1055, 100. So if I go in and say, I want to look at 10.55.100, it'll show me all the entries that are part of that subnet there. Now, when I first came in, Right, so I was on this screen and I said, show me long connections. It said no results found, why? Because here it was saying long connections, it did see nine seconds, right? Not enough to actually generate a score, but it did see something. Why is this now showing me nothing? Two reasons, one is it's filtering on just that IP address. The other is that the threshold is saying only show me connections that lasted five hours or more. Well, we saw this only ran for a couple of seconds. So I'd have to drop this down to zero to actually be able to see any of that stuff here. And as you can see, once I drop it to zero, I start getting a ton of stuff in here. <clears throat> okay, let's go back to the lab one data set because this is the one we'll be using the labs, labs in. Uh, let's see if I missed anything else. Yeah, reader under the hood. We navigated to the lab one directory. So here's all the commands for you here in case you forget what we used. <clears throat> and then reader import path to the log file. So if they weren't in the current directory I was in, I could specify some remote directory to go pull the logs from. But since they were in the directory we're working in, star.logs is plenty. I could do star and it'll check every file. If I have a bunch of non Zeek files in the directory, It'll check them to see if they're Zeek files, and if they're not, it'll just ignore them. Star.log just makes sure it doesn't do that, and it just lets the reader run a little bit faster. And then I gave it a descriptive name, and like we said, once we get to done, <clears throat> now we went in and we clicked the settings. We went to database, lab one, click the confirm button, <clears throat> and now we're in. So here's what I want you to do. <clears throat> I want you to go to the Beacon Web Module. There are six entries there with a score over 80. So I want you from this screen, go to Beacon Web, and my first six entries, one, two, three, four, five, all the way down to here, have a score above 80. After that, it drops below 80. You can also tell by the color code. It might be hard to see over a Zoom session, but there's a little red square next to this one, this one, this one, and this one, and then these two have an orange square. So we kind of color code these, so you know, red, I need to pay attention to, orange, I kind of need to pay attention to. Once you get into yellow, yeah, we're doing a little bit better here. This probably isn't too bad. So I want you to go through these first six. <clears throat> and what I want you to do is just spend about 60 seconds on each one and see if you can't figure out, is it suspicious or not? Yes or no? Shouldn't have to worry about doing deep dive. We'll do that a little bit later. But I just want you to go through and look at the data that's available, maybe jump off in a virus total or something like that if you need to, and just take a little bit to look at them. And out of those first six, 80% or higher is where we recommend you do some sort of investigation. Look at those first six and see what you find out. So I'm going to be on mute, but I'm still here. I'll be in Discord answering questions. Um, I have only two entries left under results. Let's see, if you're talking under here, check up here. Check to make sure that you don't have an IP address specified that's gonna limit the search because I can limit based on source or destination IP address. You also wanna look at threshold. If I go in and I say, only show me 90% or higher, notice it drops down to four entries. I could also say, we said we wanted to look at 80% or higher. I could set it to 80%. And it'll go through and do it that way. So if you're not seeing everything, check your settings up here. You may be filtering some of the stuff out. That's something worth going in and paying attention to. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to give you a little bit to go through and work on this. And then we'll go through and cover it. Like I said, I'm still here. I'll be answering uh, questions in Discord, but I'll give you a couple of minutes to run through it.
Ah, so we had a question. Hey, Chris, why would you import only the log files and not all the log files from Z? Great question. So let's uh, go into that directory. And what you'll see is everything but one is a dot log. The only one that's not is certs-remote.pem. Certs-remote.pem is a Zeek log, but what it is is it's a binary format log that is a full copy of every digital certificate that Zeek saw. So it just pulls it down and kind of saves it in native format. You need to use OpenSSL to even be able to view the log files that are in there. Rita and AC, uh, ACE does not use the .pem file as part of our processing. So when we said star.log, we purposely skip that. Now, they will look at that and say, yeah, this isn't a log file I need, and they'll just skip over it. But it takes that, you know, depending upon how big your log files are, it might take, uh, you know, a quarter of a millisecond, it might take a second longer to just check that file and move on. Star.log stops that from happening. But all of the logs, you, all of the files you see in this directory were created by Zeek. That's one of the ones we don't use. So we just start out log and ignore it. Great question. All right, I'll give you a little bit more time to work through this.
Okay, we're getting close to the top of the hour. So I'm going to go through and just talk about one of them, right? Maybe two. And then I'm going to give you some more time to finish it up and we'll finish covering these when we come back from the break. And we're only going to do a 10 minute break this time. But there was a question in Discord I just wanted to kind of toss out there, which was someone was asking, um, are Zeke logs considered passive threat hunting? Yes, they are. So passive is any time I'm not interacting with the stream, listening, which is really all a packet capture is doing, making a copy of the packets as they go by, would be considered a passive function. Look at it this way. Um, think of it this way. Right now, you're connected to Zoom. Is anybody sniffing your traffic? Yeah, I don't know. That's passive. <laughs> if you can't tell if somebody's sniffing the traffic, it's definitely passive. So yes, running Zeek would be considered a passive function. How do we determine what to capture and log in Zeek? Log anything that could be indicative of a command and control channel. So anything leaving your environment, going out to the internet, that's something you want to log. Well, what could I ignore? Well, you could ignore a local broadcast. You could local, ignore DHCP requests if you wanted to go through and do that. I don't ignore things unless I'm getting into performance issues, right? If I see that Zeke is having some packet loss issues, it can't keep up with the amount of traffic on the network, then I'll go in and tell Zeke, ignore broadcast, ignore multicast, ignore DHCP. And that'll usually pull back enough performance that things work fine after that. But beyond that, yeah, everything creating sessions out towards the internet, you want to go in and record all of that. So as far as this lab goes, from the dashboard, we said go to Beacon Webs. We want to analyze everything that is a score uh, or cumulative metric conformity of 80% or higher. So I could go in and just set this to 80% and that'll show me the six that I need to go in and worry about. And what I said is I want you to just go in and spot check them. Don't spend a whole lot of time. So if I click on this first one, right, this was going to an IP address out on the internet. The first thing that kind of gets me, look at the HTTP server name. It's an IP address. That should be a fully qualified domain name. People access things by fully qualified domain name, not IP. So that isn't, now leak, technically, can you do that? Sure you can, but it's an odd use of the protocol, right? How often do you type an IP address into your web browser URL? Not that often. It's mostly going to be full of qualified domain names. So that catches me as kind of odd. Um, if I look at the user agent string that was used, hi, I'm a Windows 7, you know, 7.6.1 system. What? You Windows 7? I'm sorry, what century is this? That doesn't sound right. So that user agent string looks kind of weird. Let's see, uh, Java version 1.7. Oh, I hope not. There's all sorts of vulnerabilities in that still, right? So my, and it looks like TCP 80 is actually HTTP traffic and it's going off every 30 seconds all day long, right? And if I look here, I've got my, that, yeah, that looks like a heartbeat, right? Lowest payload size and it's the greatest amount of traffic. And then I got a bunch of little bumps after that, which looks like command and control activation. Um, yeah, this one has me nervous. So I'm not going to go too far down the rabbit hole on this one. Just I'm going to mark this one as I am really suspicious. <laughs> this is what I want to learn more about. Let me go to the next one on my list. When I go to my next one, I have 25 connections. It's, it's definitely persistent. There's some hours missing, but there's some persistency here. This is going, it's TCP uh, 443 traffic. It saw the SSL header. This is going to array 506.prod.do.dsp.mp.microsoft.com. Okay, so this looks like it's uh, DSP is what? Delivery optimization service, uh, DO is delivery optimization. So basically it tries to optimize the transfer of files when you go through and patch it, patch. So this looks like a Windows system looking to pull down patches. If I look at the subject line on the digital certificate, that matches. Now notice it says star.prod. So that means any system under prod is going to use that same digital certificate. Should you be using wildcards? That's a conversation for another day, but Microsoft is choosing to do it. 
Is it an invalid cert? Yes. That's probably going to catch your attention, right? Wait a minute. This is an invalid cert. What's going on? You've got no way of knowing it from this interface, but I've gone down this rabbit hole so I can tell you what's going on. Microsoft, because you know Microsoft is a nonprofit. They don't make a whole lot of money, so they can't spend a whole lot of money on things like digital certificates. So what Microsoft, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, of course. <laughs> what Microsoft decided was we make Windows we can get make Windows accept any digital certificate we want to. So what we're going to do is self-sign these wildcard certs and tell Windows systems, here's where to check it. And if it checks out, out, okay, it's fine. So in other words, this is they didn't go through your normal certificate authority. They decided we're Microsoft. Here's the big little, you know, big finger bird. We're going to be our own certificate authority. And since we control the platform, there's nothing you can do about that. And they signed their own certs. Now, Zeek is running on Linux. Linux does not have that cert installed in it like Windows does. So when Linux looks at it, it says, I don't recognize this certificate authority. They're not an authorized authority. Could we fix this? Yes, we could take the digital certificate and we could install it in the Linux key ring and Linux will properly go through and certify these if we wanted to. So that's why it looks like it's an invalid cert. But if we assume this cert is actually okay, this is just a Windows system doing patching. All right, I ran you a little bit over the top of the hour. We're good and doing good on time. So I wanna give you time. So what you just saw me do, we've got four more systems in here. So go through and check those out as well. Uh, actually, if I go to 80%, then there's six systems in here. So yeah, we've already talked about these first two. So take a look at the last four. And like I said, 60 seconds is all I want you to spend. And make a determination, I'm leaning towards evil or I'm leaning towards it's okay. All right, I am going to go on mute for the next 10 minutes. We are on break until 15 minutes after the top of the hour. I will catch you then.
Okay, we get about two minutes before we're going to start. <clears throat> but one thing I wanted to show you, you may have run across this if you're messing around. If you go to themes, you can go to DaVinci mode. And ooh, everything's bright, bright, bright. <laughs> so that may come in handy sometimes. Uh, also, keep an eye on this background here. So notice it kind of looks like a, almost like a little 3D tapestry or a 3D uh, view of, of, of a landscape. If I go in and I load a different data set, once that pops up, notice the landscape changed. It's got dip bumps in different spots now. The artwork in the background can actually help you threat hunt if you know how to read this background landscape. Um, I've kind of picked up on a little pattern, some, some different patterns to go looking for. Uh, it's beyond the scope of this class to get into that. But um, it's one of the things that the developers threw in and then told me about after the fact. But I thought it was something that was pretty cool. So I'll go back into game mode. We were in Beacon's Web. We were filtering on 80% or higher. And what I was telling you to do was to go through these. So we just talked about the first two. Take a look at the last four. I'm going to give you about a minute to go through this threat geography. Yes, <laughs> it is threat geography. Absolutely. A little like watching the Matrix. Yes. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to give you another minute to just take a quick spot check of those, and then we'll run through the last four together. Um, but the, the point of this is to show you that if you have the right information, threat hunting isn't that hard. You know, if we were just looking at the IP address here and that's it, there's a lot of research we'd have to do. But having all of this information right at our fingers makes it a whole lot easier to go in and quickly make determinations about what we need to worry about and what we haven't. So we said, first one's looking suspicious. We're going to come back and revisit that. Second one we looked at and we said, yeah, no, this is just Windows system trying to find patches, not a big deal. So like I said, take a look at those last four and see what you can find out. I'm going to give you just another minute to finish these up. It shouldn't even take you that long. Yeah, someone was asking about why does the cert uh, listed as invalid? Yes. So what Microsoft did is they said, we own the platform. And if you don't feel like Microsoft owns your Windows system, go read your end user license agreement. They own your system. You're just leasing it from them. Um, and since they own your platform, they can install any digital certificates they want to within your registry. So what Microsoft did is they self-signed their own certs and they shipped that out with Windows so that when you try to go to one of their patching servers, their thought process was Windows systems will be the only ones going there. Therefore, we only need to worry about Windows systems looking at those certs as being valid. And since we've pre-installed the digital certificate onto those systems, they'll all identify it as being valid, problem solved. The reason it's showing up as invalid here is because Linux is seeing that digital certificate go by, grabbing a copy of it out of, out of Zeek, and then Zeek is using the key store within Linux to try to verify it. And of course, it doesn't verify because that digital certificate hasn't been installed in, in the Linux key, key ring. So we could choose to install it, and then Linux would go through and verify it, but I didn't do that for these labs. <clears throat> Um, go back to the screen, Lake. Can we see the threat geography demo again? Yeah, so you, you can see it. Well, you'll see it in the background here on the main screen. And actually, it pretty much shows up everywhere, right? And if I go in and I change my data set, you'll see that this landscape changes. 
And what they did is they decided we're going to go through and do a read on the data set and reformat the background based on what we're seeing for data inside of that. So that's what's going on there. All right. So I'm going to 80%. We talked about these first two. Let's look at the third one. Third one is tileservice.weather.microsoft.com. Get request, it's HTTP. This looks like it's probably okay too. This is somebody running tile services on their Windows system. And you know they have a weather tile open that tells them what the local weather is. And this is just checking in to see what the weather is. And it's doing it twice an hour. Okay, that one's probably okay. If I go to the next one, we've got another array here. I think the first one we looked at was array 506. This one is array 509, but it's that same delivery optimization for patches that we're looking at here. Okay, the next one, Windows Update. So this is a Windows Update check. Again, this is involved with patching, so this is probably okay. If we look at our last one, now we've got array 503. So here's a case where we had six beacons and we're able to go through and identify, okay, out of the, and by the way, there's thousands of connections in this data set. I think there's 3,800, if I remember correctly. There's somewhere around 3,800 different connection pairs going out to the internet. And there's only six here that are interesting, five, only one that's really interesting. And we're able to whittle down to that very quickly. Figuring out where's the connection persistency that I need to investigate, that's the hardest part of doing threat hunting. And this is part of what this tool goes through and tries to make easier. Uh, won't the IP lookup be the first check? Well, it depends, right? I could I could certainly go through and, you know, check out, you know, security trails or virus total or whatever, um, but I don't have to, right? Like with this one here, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm saying, oh, well, actually this one's just an IP address. That's the first one. So yeah, that one I would worry about a little bit. But like these here where we didn't bother using any of the uh, any of these lookup tools, why didn't we? Well, because we can see the user was trying to get to this uh, to this fully qualified domain name. The digital certificate matches it. Even though this says invalid cert, I said, assume they're legit. And I said that because had this been a production environment, we would install the digital certificate for this. So it would be able to go through and validate them properly, in which case it would tell us, you know, no, this is an invalid, this is a valid cert, don't worry about it. But we we're able to figure that out really quickly. Um, it's lab one folder after importing the reader files. Yep, Chris is working with lab one database. Yes, and you can see that up here. So on the right-hand side here in orange, it says database lab one. So I always know what database I'm in at any given time. Um, module beacon web. So I know what module I'm in. It highlights it down here too. I can see it's in bright white, but you know it tells me up here and then it tells me the timestamp I'm working with. Uh, let's see, won't the IP lookup be the first check? Thanks, see Brighton. Yeah, no problem. No problem, that's why I'm here. Cool, so we ran through these six. Let's see if I missed anything. So like I said, for these labs, I'll give you the problem, which is what we were looking at here. If you're not sure what to do, the next slide is always gonna be hints. And then after that, I'll get into doing the answers. And we said this first one, this looks suspicious. And we talked about why, right? 3000 connections in the course of the day. We've got a flat beacon signal here. It's claiming to be a Windows 7 system. That just doesn't sound right to me. Uh, histograms flat, no host string. It was an IP address. We talked about that. So right off the bat, I would say this one makes me nervous. Put it aside and move on from here. Why? Because we, we know we're going to have to go down a rabbit hole to figure this one out, right? That's going to take some time. Why not get rid of the easy stuff first? So I usually do my threat hunts in multiple passes. I'll do one pass to say, Where's the low hanging fruit? Where's the stuff I can look at and say, there's a business need for that, don't worry about it. And I can get that out of the way right away. And then once those are done, now I'll go do a second pass and go back through and hit the ones that are a little bit harder. <clears throat> that second entry we said, you know, looks like it's okay. I said, it says it's an invalid cert, but um, the cert's actually okay. And I explained why. Third and fourth entries, same type of thing. 
fifth and sixth entries, same type of thing. So we had a lot of Windows patching. That's something you're going to run into a lot. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to create safe list entries so that these five of the six that we came up with don't show up in the data set anymore. La, la, yeah, so the last, so the first one, like we said, we need to deep dive on that. We'll come back to it. But entries uh, two through six, this one through this one, go in and investigate those. And if you see something different, that's because I have my threshold set to 80%, it gets set to 50% by default. I just set it to 80%. So that way it's only showing me the stuff that I want to go in and focus in on. So go in. Give this one a shot. Uh, any questions, just go ahead and throw them into the Discord channel. I'm going to go on mute while you work on this one. This one should be fairly easy for you. So is that just me or was that everybody who got kicked out? <laughs> uh, I was still on, but yeah, you and I think Bill dropped out. I'm still here. I'm, st okay. I'm still, still here. here. Well, you're back now, but there was a moment where I think there's only two or three of us on here. Okay. I wasn't disconnected, although we have dropped down about 200 people on the uh, call. All right, so I think uh, one of the Zoom servers had problems, would be my guess. Okay. And some of us are on it, and some of us are someplace else. Huh. So well, that right would explain, yeah. yeah. 730 participants. Right, and I looked at it just before we started doing the lab, and we were close to 900. So we definitely uh -huh. uh, lost some people who were going to need to join back in. Oh, bummer. Well, mm -hmm. Zoom hiccup. Yeah, I don't know what's going on with Zoom today. It is not a happy camper. I blame Jason. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Only because it's not you for a change, right, Bill? Well, there is that. <laughs> yes. Uh, can you guys still see my screen? Nope. No, we cannot. No. Okay. Let me do a reshare on that, which is weird because it was saying I was sharing. Yeah, so I had to stop and I had to restart the share again. Cool. How about now? Okay, yeah, we can see it. And awesome. people say Discord, they can too. Awesome. Perfect. All right. Thank you, folks. So, yeah, so to go back to that question before I was so rudely interrupted, um, it's only manual because we're manually pulling in the data sets. Normally, what you would do is you would have Zeke running at your perimeter. And Zeek would collect the logs each hour. And when you install Zeek with our utility, it's going to set up SSH to automatically copy those log files over to AC Hunter for you. It'll drop them into a directory that AC Hunter is then going to automatically check for. And it will automatically add them to this local dash rolling data set. We're not doing that here because the only way we'd be able to get that to work is for me to have you replay PCAPs and capture it, and that would just add to the complexity of these labs that has absolutely nothing to do with what we're here to learn. 
So it, it can be a manual process, right? If you want it to, but it doesn't have to be a manual process. All right. So let's talk about these a little bit. So like I said, this first one, we know we want to do some deeper investigation on. The second one, this array, we know we saw array 503 and array 509 as well, right? So I'm going to go in, I'm going to click my safe list icon. I'm going to say I want to do a wildcard match. And I'm going to go in and I'm going to say anything in prod. Now, why don't I just say everything at Microsoft? I could do that if I want to. I tend to be a little nervous and don't want to like, because remember, once you safe list it, you're not going to see the data anymore. ACE will still create collect it. It'll still store it in the database, but you won't see it unless you go in and delete a safe list entry. So knowing that, I try to err on the side of caution and not make these any more general than I have to. So uh, I'm just going to call it DO, DO patching and just assume I put my name down and the date on this. And then I'm going to go in and I'm going to safe list it. It'll take it a second to go through and run the safe list. And then once that's done, I should notice that. Notice we had six entries here. But now I've only got three. And that's because my wild card matched on all three of those arrays at the same time. So now if I go to my second one, this was tile service. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to say I want to do a, a match against this. And I'll say anything weather.com at Microsoft is OK. And I'm going to safe list that. My last one, Windows Update. Yeah, that one I guess I'll feel a little bit more comfortable with. So I'm going to say anything at windowsupdate.com is okay. Safe list that. And notice we're down to just one entry now. So now as other systems talk to those hosts, they're not going to get scored. They're not going to show up in the data anymore. We're still collecting it. So if I delete that safe list entry, all the data that was collected will immediately get presented to me. But now I'm just down to this one system I need to worry about and that's it. So if you think about it, it takes now a threat hunt would take one sixth the amount of time because we don't have as many systems that we need to be concerned about. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Uh, what do your notes reporting look like when you're threat hunting? Oh, good question. Um, I, so there's the notes for me and then there's the notes for other people who are not me to read. I tend to go through and kind of use my own little shorthand and I will jot down all the stuff I'm looking at and when I'm looking at it. And then what I'll do is a second pass where I'll kind of copy paste out of that into another document to make it something that tells more of a story. Sometimes I may jump around when I'm doing a threat hunt because, you know, oh, pretty shiny to the left, got to go over there. Oh, pretty shiny to the right, got to go over there. And for someone reading a report, that can be really hard to follow. So I always do my first pass, make sure I collect all my data. And then I do a second half and I almost try to do it like a novel, right? A novel has got to have a con con coherent storyline that people can follow. I try to make my final reports look more like that instead. So these sick, great question, by the way. So, you know, this says you only really needed three safe list entries. And that took care of those five because we had three of them that were coming out of that same uh, section of the domain. But you could go in and set them up any way that you wanted to. <clears throat> and then as we added them, all the other stuff started getting removed as well, which was kind of good. And we did not do this, but if I go view my safe list now, so if I go back to my dashboard, go to settings up here on the right, <clears throat> and then go to safe lists here, I can say I can see I have four safe list entries now. If I say view edit, there's all the safe list entries I've created so far. <laughs> so if you ever need to review them or know what's there, you know it's it's here to be able to go through and review at any time. And these get applied to everything. So if I go load a different database, these safe lists will automatically be applied. If Bill logs into this system these safe lists will get applied for him as well. So these safe lists are global. <clears throat> so 
Squirrel. Yeah, I get distracted by squirrels a lot too. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so here's what I want you to do next. So we're still working with the lab one data set. But now what I want you to do is I want you to go evaluate long connections and take a look at anything that lasted over five hours. Same thing we did with the Beacon Web module. 60 seconds max. If you can't make a determination in 60 seconds, make a note of it and mark it as something that you need to come back and deep dive on later. But we're doing our first pass here. So we're going for the low hanging fruit first. Take a look at the first five. Uh, we'll take a look at everything that lasted more than five hours and see, can I immediately dismiss this as there being a business need? Yes or no? So go in, give this one a shot. I'm still here. I'm just going to go on mute while you work through this lab. Uh, let's see. Does ACH support collaborative hunting? Can you share results to someone else rather than second line analytics, et cetera? So threat hunt reports tend to have a lot of very sensitive customer information in it. So it's not something that we tend to share out with anyone. Um, all of these data sets we're working with is stuff we created. We never, ever, ever use customer type of data, just in case, because you never know. So yeah, any anything, so to be honest, even uh, within the organization itself, we kind of petition things off. So I may do a hunt on a network. KC works sales. She doesn't need to see the results of that. She doesn't need to go through it. So she'll be isolated off from that. If I'm doing the hunt with Keith, Keith and I will talk about it. And if there's something we're confused about, we might pull Bill in for a small section and only reveal with him what we have to. But we're very compartmentalized as far as being able to share stuff out. All right. Why don't you go ahead and hit this lab? I'm going to go on mute. Any questions, throw it into Discord.
Okay, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to keep going, finish going through this, but we've had a bunch of questions and I want to make sure I take time to go through and, and handle those. So the uh, let's start with the easy stuff. So somebody was asking about uh, doing searches. So one of the things you can usually do is, uh, let me just copy that IP address, is you can search for IPs based on the source or the destination. So you can see when I put in that destination IP, that's the only thing that kind of showed up there. Someone was asking about using, can you use wildcards? Yes, but you don't actually have to use wildcards. So I've got, let's see, 1055, uh, 100, 1055, 182, 1055, 200 here. So if I go into my beacon screen and I say, I only care about 10.55.200 and hit enter, notice the only entries that show up are part of that subnet. So you can search based on source or destination IP address. And you can, you don't have to use wildcards you just simply only use the part of the address that you actually care about, and you can go through and you can do it that way. So the other co uh, comment was along the lines of, you know, can C2 originate from Microsoft? Oh, this is a bag of worms. So back before Azure, Microsoft was actually pretty tight with their environment. In fact, um, Microsoft designated ASN, I think it was 8075, if I remember correctly, is their backend management service. So 8075 was kind of, hey, this is going to be patching and time checking and all that other fun stuff. And if it's going to that ASN, it's safe. Don't worry about it. It's managed by our, the Microsoft security team. So, so long as you trust the Microsoft security team to do their job, you can trust sources that are out of that address space. And then they started moving their resources into Azure and they mapped 8075 into, you guessed it, Azure. And if you know what you're doing, you can actually gain an IP address that's part of 8075, which means it probably has a generic Microsoft descriptor as the fully, Microsoft.com descriptor is the fully qualified domain name. So could you possibly see something going to Microsoft.com that's actually C2? Unfortunately, yeah. I've, I've seen it. I haven't seen it with the fully qualified domain name of Microsoft.com. I have seen it with 8075, which is supposed to just be their systems. But if you know what you're doing, you can spin up a VM within that, in, within that space. And like I said, my, my, if I remember correctly, that entire space has some sort of generic Microsoft.com descriptor to it. So even though I haven't seen it personally, I believe, yeah, you probably could. That's why when you saw me going in, I didn't want a wildcard all at Microsoft.com. I wanted it, you know, prod.do. blah, blah, blah. The smallest section I, I could get away with while still being able to safe list multiple systems at the same time. That's part of the reason why. So um, Azure has made Microsoft a little bit less secure than it used to be, unfortunately. So uh, I forget who it was who, who originally uh, tossed that comment in about, you know, it's a fact. Neb Nebulous was saying, not a question, but a fact. I haven't seen it personally. But from what I understand about what they're doing, I would have to agree with them. Yeah, I think it's entirely possible. I haven't put effort into trying. I'd be afraid if I did. Um, but yeah, you could probably get away with doing that. Um, let's see what else here. Yeah, so someone was talking about, um, you know, looking at the SPIs. Yeah, so if we look at the SPI information instead of looking at the IPs, what that's good for is if something is going to, let's say, Akamai, that doesn't really tell us anything, right? Lots of, lots, Akamai has lots of customers. So we need to look at the SPI, which is what the Beacon Web module is for, in order to be able to figure out where were they trying to get to on the other side of all of that. Uh, let's see, did I miss anything from there? Oh yes, Lerner was asking, is there a data set for identifying C2 over DNS social media and CDN? Great question. 
So while uh, there is one included in the VM for uh, DNS, um, DNS CAT2, it has DNS, it has a DNS C2 traffic channel in it. There's actually a couple of different C2 channels that are in there. Uh, we have one for CDNs. I don't think we've shared that yet. There is a data set for um, um, for a social media called GCAT, and I don't think we put that in the CE version. I think it's just in the enterprise version, just because we wanted to reduce the number of data sets that we distribute in order to try and reduce the size of what's getting distributed. Um, but so there is some stuff out there. Um, and I would hit up, um, let me show you this. So this is a good one for after this class too. So one of the things you may run into is you say, hey, this was fun. I want to keep practicing. I want to work with this a little bit more. Um, go to our website, go to the blog section like you just saw me do, do a search for malware of the day. This is Keith's thing. So if I go in and do for search for that, and it gives me more than just malware of the day. That was weird. I'm not sure why that's, and it's clearing it on me. So I'm not sure why. Well, anyway, we have a section called uh, malware of the day. Well, actually some of these are malware related. So maybe it's just picking up on that keyword. But we have a, um, a, a thread called malware of the day. Let me see if I can't find one here. And those are different C2 channels that work different ways. So one of the things you can do is you can download, uh, here we go. So this one's crypto mining, right? So here's what you do. Go to one of the malware of the days, click on it. Don't read it. Quick, 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 flip to the bottom, all the way to the bottom. And then slowly go back up until you get to the PCAP files. This one just has a five hour capture. Usually there's a one hour and a 24 hour. Download the 24 hour, run it through Zeek, get Zeek logs, pull that into AC Hunter, do a hunt. Can you figure out what's going on? Once you think you have an answer, go back to this page. Now start at the beginning and read through. Did you miss anything? So that's one way you can go through and keep practicing once you get out of here. All right. And with that said, let's kind of talk about this one a little bit. So we were saying um, five hours or longer is interesting to us in the long connections. So we're in the lab one data set. You should only see one source showed up. I wanted to try and keep this as simple as possible, but there's only, the threshold is automatically set to five hours. There should only be two. I can set this lower if I want to, but you know, who cares? <laughs> I don't care, I care about longer stuff. So I'm going to go back and set that to that five hour threshold. So we have a couple here that have been running for 24 hours. <clears throat> this first one, TCP port 9200, we don't see what the protocol is. Going into DigitalOcean, we don't see a DNS query, but it's over 24 hours old, so that probably happened ahead of time. What can we find out about this one? Well, if I go into VirusTotal, VirusTotal is telling me, oh, hey, that's associated with demo1.ahhosted.com. Huh, who the heck are they? All right, this is where I would probably... Um, spin up a virtual machine in Amazon, right? Spin up a virtual desktop in Amazon, launch a web browser and say, I want to go to www.aihhosted.com. And let's see what's there. Oh, that goes to active countermeasures. Who are they? What do they do? Oh, they make this AC Hunter thing. Okay. Hey, purchasing department, have we paid active countermeasures for any software or services? Oh, yes, this security team did. Great. Let me go talk to them. What's going on here? Is there a legitimate business need for this? Yes, there is. Okay, great. We're fine. Now I can go in and I can safe list that entry. The second one, again, we didn't see the start of the session. So again, we're kind of back to, hey, let's go see what Virus Total knows about it. And Virus Total, uh, no, that's the same entry. Oh, because I didn't highlight the second entry. You have to highlight it first. So this is saying it's going to Microsoft Corp. And if I go in and I look at Virus Total, what does Virus Total know about it? They're identifying this as a Windows notification server. Now notice sometimes it's Cloud App Azure, that's still Microsoft. Traffic Manager.net, that's still Microsoft. 
but it looks like fairly consistently this is a Windows notification server. So this is a Windows box calling out to see, is there anything on the Windows notification bus for me to be informed about? So we have two entries, assuming that we're doing business with active countermeasures, both of these we could go through in safe list and then we wouldn't have to worry about it. And we could do it based on the IP address or in the, uh, we could go in and do it based on the fully qualified domain name. Let's see, you can also see uh, what's being hosted by GoDaddy. Yep, you can go in and take a look for that. Uh, what's port 9200? Um, that is, I think, the elk, an elk stack running on that box. I think that's feeding into an elk database. Um, let's see what else is Chris from New Hampshire. Yes. So I'm in Florida these days. I'm on the Southwest coast, uh, where it's sunny and warm all the time. I got tired of shoveling snow. So I moved down here about five years ago, but I moved down here from Merrimack, New Hampshire, uh, before that, I was in Bedford, New Hampshire. And before that, I lived not too far away from Bill, which is about the middle part of New Hampshire. Uh, let's see what else is fun in here. Boston. Yes, okay. <laughs> Remember AC Hunter is already installed. Uh, the previous entry is port 9200 normal. No, not really. Um, this was kind of a special case with that one particular system that's feeding some data into an elk stack. <clears throat> AC Hunter isn't going to do that uh, on its own. <clears throat> All right. So let's see if I missed anything. So there was no fully qualified domain name information to work with. And I mentioned that's probably because the connection started more than 24 hours ago. But we went in, we did some poking around, we found out what host names were associated with those. Um, you know, what if I visit the IP address while well, you get the AC Hunter login? Or if I go to the website, we got directed to uh, active countermeasures. And like I said, I would never, ever, ever do this from a business related connection. I wouldn't do this from behind my company firewall. I would, you know, spin up a virtual machine or a virtual desktop in one of the many environments that support that and do the connection from there. And now they will see a connection coming in, but it won't have anything to do with our address base. The second one, like we said, this looks like a Windows notification server. So to sanity check, we have one suspect beacon. That was our very top one on the list. We need to dig a little bit deeper on that. We have five beacons that we were able to look at and say, there's a business need associated with that. We have two long connections that we looked at and said, yeah, there's probably a business need associated with those as well. So, you know, first time using the tool, it's gonna take you a little bit longer than normal, but you're probably noticing it's easy to kind of work through these things pretty quickly and figure out if there's something you need to worry about or not, right? So here's what we're gonna do. So that first beacon IP we were going out to is suspect. We want to deep dive on this one a little bit longer. If you're on the VM, what I want you to do is I want you to go look at the log files, right? We've got that IP address. Hmm, what's that search tool, grr something, grr, 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 grab. Yeah, that was it. Grep might be helpful along with this IP address. What can you learn about what was going on in that connection by going back in and taking a look at the Zeek files? So I'll tell you what we're gonna do. It is seven minutes before the top of the hour. We're gonna take a 10 minute break at the top of the hour. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of call it now. I'm gonna stick out for seven minutes, answer questions as needed. You can do the lab and then take your break. You can take a break, come back, do the lab either way. But what I will do is I will wait till 10 minutes after the top of the hour, and then I'm gonna go through and I'm gonna cover this one. Okay, I'm here, <clears throat> but we've got about another minute before we're really gonna start up. Uh, but I see a couple of questions I wanna make sure I answer uh, in the Discord channel. One was we are on lab two at the moment or on to the next one. No, we are still working in the lab one directory. Um, we haven't moved on to lab two yet. So that's that one. Oh, and I wanted to say hi to Steve from Nashua, whose work wouldn't let him into Discord. Hey, Steve, how you doing? Glad you could, glad you could attend. Uh, let's see. Oh, someone was asking, what's the command to make Zeke logs? 
So if you type in Zeke space dash capital C, and Zeke is uh, not on the VM, uh, it'll be in the next version. It's not on this one. So you got to run Zeke on a different system. But Zeke space dash capital C, that just dash capital C tells it to ignore CRC checking on packets. Dash R, and it'll read the PCAP file. And then the local keyword, and that'll load up all of its default configs. Um, that'll create the Zeke logs. That's what I ran against a PCAP to create the Zeke logs that we're using. And then once you have the PCAP files, read a space, import, space, star.log, space, whatever you want to name the data set, and you're off to the races. Um, Bill also included a command, um, but that may not like do everything right. Because Bill, you may remember, that's actually still trying to use Bro. Uh, we wanted to use Zeke because Bro didn't have everything we needed. And it seems like it works, but it actually gives you incorrect data. All right. No man database for Zeke. Yes, because Zeke is not on the on this VM. Uh, we'll add it in the next time we release the community edition. It didn't make it into this one. Uh, how do we get live real-time Zeke data into ACH? So like I said, if you run the install script, it will say what IP address do you want to install AC Hunter? You tell it where, you tell it what account to use to log in to install it. And it will ask you, where do you install, where do you want to install Zeke? Or what IP address? Tell it, tell it what account to use. And the tool will add it, actually automatically take care of setting that up for you. So you'll create a, it'll create a user named data import user. It'll generate public private keys for it. It'll put a copy of the public key on the AC Hunter system. And that way, when the Zeek system wants to transfer files over, that public key on the AC Hunter system validates that the private key was used on the Zeek system side, and it'll let you do the file transfer without having to do any type of an interactive prompt. It seems like <laughs> it's poor set, uh, security because you're not it's not prompting for a password, but it's actually a feature using keys, and keys are more secure than actually trying to use passwords. <clears throat> Can you put the Zeek command into this chat, please, as I missed it? Sure, I'll toss that in again, no problem. So it's just Zeek space dash capital C dash R, the name of the PCAP file, and then you want to make sure at the end you put the local keyword in. Uh, that makes sure it loads up the proper config to go through and parse that file. Once you do that, it'll go through and it'll pull all that stuff in. <clears throat> uh, what about recording futures triage? Uh, I've heard some recorded future stuff. I haven't heard their triage stuff. Uh, let's see, what else? Yeah, that seems to kind of catch us up a little bit. Cool. <clears throat> so... This IP address, the 104, let's go in and kind of mess around with that a little bit and see what we can learn about that one. <clears throat> um, God, I have way too many windows open. Come on, Chris, get with it. There we go. That's the screen I want. So I am currently in the Lab1 directory. This is where the, this is where the files were that we imported in. So... I've got an IP address to work with. So I'm just going to say grep space 104.248.234.238. So this was the IP address of that one beacon that we looked at that we said, I'm not sure what to make of that. And I'm just going to pub that through less space dash capital S. So grep is going to search all of the log files looking for that IP address and we'll see what it finds. <clears throat> So here is con.log, and it's just seeing a lot of TCP port 80 connections going by, right? And if I just kind of page through, yeah, there's a ton of them. So I'm searching all my log files. I may actually want to be a little bit more specific. So I'm going to go back, and we know it's HTTP traffic. So I'm going to say specifically, I want to look at the HTTP.log file. Okay. Here's my timestamp in the first column. Here's that unique identifier we talked about. Source IP, source port, destination IP, destination port. Okay, so far no different than what we saw in con.log, right? But then we start getting into some more useful HTTP type specific information. The method used was a get request. So it was trying to get information. The host parameter, we saw this before, is an IP address. That should be a fully qualified domain name, and it's not. That's a problem. Let's do a quick check for something. I'm going to grep for that IP address, 
and dns.log just to see did anybody look something up to look in that resulted in that ip we're pretty certain the answer is going to be no because we didn't see it on the ac hunter screen but i'm going to check the log file just to see and as you can see yeah no there were no dns lookups that returned that ip so the fact that DNS was not used to access the site, that's suspicious. The fact that the host parameter is a raw IP address, that's suspicious. Now they're trying to access some file or something within the rmvk30g directory. That, when I go through stuff and I find stuff that's odd, I try to look for little snippets that maybe I can Google that might give me more helpful information. That's one that I may go in and try and do a search on. Now, I could try and search for this URI, but it's a wicked long string. So I'm guessing I'm probably not going to see much in Google that matches that. But this short, fairly unique string right here, that's something that Google might actually be able to help out with. But let's see what that full URI is. Yeah, it's long. I've paged over four or five times already. Now, notice here. There's no file extension for what the user is trying to access. That's a little odd because what this implies is that they're probably trying to access a subdirectory that has this big long name to it, right? Oh yeah, because everybody uses something like this to name their directories, right? No, I don't think so. So that doesn't make sense. Um, this is just looking really strange to me. And then it's got some semicolon characters at the end that it's specifying. That's kind of strange. Um, it's using, uh, the connection was using HTML version 1.1. Okay, that's fine. Uh, let's see, the browser is Mozilla on Windows 7 running Java 1.7. We saw that in the user agent string. That doesn't look right. Now it looks like it's using that consistently. So we're going to come back and revisit that in just a little bit. 200 OK tells us the server was OK with this URI being requested, which means that this isn't something that um, this isn't something that the server puked on. It thought this was actually OK. See what else we find out. And that's it. That's all it has recorded. So there's a couple of things in here that are kind of interesting to me. The user agent string is interesting. The uh, URI they're accessing is interesting. So what I'm gonna do, let me show you this real quick, is I'm gonna use ZCut to go in and look at some of these fields. So I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna look at the destination IP address because I wanna be able to just grep on this IP and make sure this is the only one I'm actually matching on. I'm going to want to look at, let's see, we'll look at the host parameter string, the URI. There was no referrer field. Uh, and we'll look at the user agent string. And we'll see, do those get changed at all? So I'm going to say cat http.log. Then I'm going to pipe that through zcut. So I'm saying print out the content. So again, if I kind of do these in steps, if I say cat http.log, woo, it just scrolls everything by on the screen. Okay, that's not very helpful, right? So now I'm going to say Z cut. I want to see ID dot RESP underscore H. That's going to be the destination IP address. Then I want to see, let's see, what was I saying? I said, I want to see the uh, host agent string. I want to see the URI and I want to see the user agent string. So I want to be able to go in and look at all of those. So now if I hit enter to kind of see, well, I have to spell user right. <laughs> Jeez, Chris, come on. Spelling matters. Okay, it still looks kind of weird. We're getting everything out, but it's still kind of popping up and uh, just kind of giving me everything on the screen. So let's see if we can't clean this up a little bit. So I'm going to say, okay, Z cut, cut out those fields. And then I'm going to say grep. And it's this 104 address that I'm interested in. So only show me that stuff. And then I'm going to say sort unique dash C sort dash RN. What does that do? 
So sort just lines up all the data line by line when it matches. Unique C means collapse it down to a single line and count how many lines there were originally. And sort-rn simply says, print out the results, highest number of hits to lowest number of hits. So if I go through and I run that, let me get some white space here. You can see all 311, uh, 3,011 connections had that host agent string of just an IP address only, hit the same URI over and over again, and always had that user agent string. Now, <clears throat> there is a top, the one, there's two cases where you might see somebody hitting a long, weird URI like that. One is a vulnerability check. There may be some known vulnerabilities with our software that they're probing to see, are we vulnerable to? The, I don't think that's what's happening here because when somebody does a vulnerability check, they check the vulnerability once, maybe twice max. This hit the same URI 3,011 times. So that doesn't make sense to me. So I don't think it's a vulnerability check. I think this is a C2 channel. It's calling in, it's hitting that same link, and this is its way of saying, hey, I'm here. Do you have anything for me to do? And whatever gets accessed when they hit this link, that's what gives them back their marching orders. So what they're getting back is probably a text file that tells them, here's what I want you to go through and execute from here. So this definitely looks like C2 to me. Now, the one other thing I wanted to go through and check is let's uh, trim this down a little bit. And the only thing I want to look at is the user agent string. Um, let's see, ID dot, what do I want to look at? Let's look at the destination IP address and the user agent string. Let's uh, not grep out that IP address. Let's do this. Yeah. So here's what we're doing. We're catting the HTTP.log file. We're cutting out the destination IP address as well as the user agent string. And then we're running it through sort unique sort. What I want to see is what IP addresses are using what agent strings and how often. And if I go through and look, I've got a bunch of them in here. Actually, yeah, let's throw that filter back in so we're only looking at that one. <laughs> um, oh, give me a second. Oh, yeah, no, I don't need any of this. I don't need that. I don't want to limit it to just that target IP address. So what I'm saying is show me all the user agent strings the system is using. Um, this is my only source that's in there. And this is telling me sometimes it says it's Windows 7. Some, we looked at this before when we looked at the slides. Sometimes it's identifying itself as being Windows 10. That's a problem. That's something we need to go and pay attention to. So I saw somebody post in, you know, it looks like Fiesta. Yeah, it does. If I do a search on this portion of the URI, or actually just this portion here, you'll get hits telling you that, that this looks like it's Fiesta. And you may even hit the malware of the day site on the actor countermeasure site when you get a hit on this. So we had a bunch of, so again, we had about 3,800 connections here. One of them was actually C2. It didn't take us that long to run it down. I mean, we did this as labs. I kind of handheld you a little bit. But once you kind of got used to the tool to kind of whip through the data and figure out this is the one you have to pay attention to, it isn't going to take you that long. Let's see if I missed anything. So, yeah, we were looking at this saying, yep, this looks like potential C2 activation uh, with data sizes up to, let's call that about 1,400 bytes or less. So it looks like something's being done here. Some data is being transferred. It may not, they may not have started copying files off yet, but they've definitely done some poking around, looked at some processes, what's located where. Um, this is definitely something we need to go in and kind of worry about. Um, no fully qualified domain name. You know, we talked about that. Uh, we talked about all the different parameters in the HTTP string that look weird. We talked about how usually this is, you know, looks like it's a Windows 10 system. But in this one case, it looks like Windows 7. That's a problem. Um, you know, user agent analysis. So here I went through and broke down 
This one was a little different. This here, what I went through and did is I broke it down based upon the number of destination IP addresses that a specific user agent string was used on. And you can see 29 times, 20 different, uh, 29 different IPs, this string was used, 16 that one, eight one, one for this. The only time it was this window seven was when I was talking to this one IP address and that's it. Uh, can the speaker turn up his mic a bit? If I do, I blow people's ears out. <laughs> so you may want to turn up the volume on your side a little bit. Uh, based on the reaction I've gotten before, I think I'm already lined up loud enough. So yeah, this was the one we needed to worry about. And Fiesta EK, if we do some Googling on that. And like I said, there's a lot of connections in this file. We were able to whittle it down to the stuff we needed to worry about really quickly. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do lab two. This time, I'm going to kind of cut you loose and just let you do your own thing. So I'm not going to handhold you through every little step. I want you to go in, poke around, look under beacons, look under long connections, and see what you can find for yourself. But I will walk you through the, the data import. The slides for this, right? Here, I walked you through how to do the data import. So you have it in the slides, but I'll let you watch me go in and do it live. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to change to the lab two directory. So I'm going to say cd space dot dot forward slash lab two. That'll move me up one directory, back down one to the lab two directory. And if I take a look at what's in there, I've got a couple of log files in there and that's it. Not nearly as many as we had last time. Now I'm going to say Rita import star dot log and we'll call this lab two. Hit go. It's going to want my password which is hunting. Now notice it didn't come up with a whole lot. No proxy data, no TLS or HTTP data to worry about. The only thing it seemed to find was DNS information. Hmm, that's interesting. So now here's what I want you to do, Mr. Phelps. I want you to go into the AC Hunter interface Click the little settings icon. Here's this lab two database we just created. Load that up. Ooh, no results found. But look up here, potential C2 over DNS. Somebody was asking if we have examples of C2 over DNS. This might be one of them. I would click on that and then take a look and see what you think. I'll give you a couple minutes to kind of work through this one and then we'll go through and we'll cover it together. So there was a question, can't we view this within um, ACE? Some of this stuff you really can't present in a UI. So for example, uh, uh, InfoSec Hunters gave you a copy of the ex uh, command that went through and kind of showed you how many hits were showing up per user agent string. That's, you know, twisting the data that way is not something we can really do within the interface the way it is today. Now, with that said, we are working on solving that problem. We've actually got a major rewrite going which is going to completely change the back end, and then we're going to completely change the front end. But that's going to be taking place over the next year. I don't want to go to, too far down there right now. So yeah, for some of this stuff, it makes sense to jump into the Z logs. But you can get an awful lot of this information out of the AC Hunter interface. All right, let me let you keep going with the labs. I'll give you a little bit, and then we'll talk about it.
So I'm not good talking. I just wanted to leave that last command I typed to uh, import the database up there so people can see that. And then once you do that, just go to settings, databases, select lab two, and you're off to the races.
Okay, just to make sure we're kind of all on the same page. So we, we've moved into the lab two directory. So the first thing we need to do is to CD into the lab two directory, which I did here. I gave you a command for that down in the chat channel. Once you CD into that directory, you then have to import those Zeek logs. Here's the command to do that. So read a space, import space, star.log, all the logs in this current at lab two directory. And then we need to name the database something within ACE. So here we just named it lab two because we're working in the lab two directory. And again, for consistency, it just makes life a little bit easier. So now if I go to ACE, I should be able to go to settings up here in the upper right. Under database, I should now have a lab two data set. I can select that and hit confirm. Now, when you do that, it looks like no results found, right? But if you look in the upper left here, you're going to see potential C2 over DNS. Why do we do that different? Because think about how C2 over DNS works, right? I have a compromised system. It's talking to the local resolver, and the resolver is the one going out and talking to the command and control server. Most people are going to be monitoring at their firewall. So the source IP address you see generating the C2 over DNS traffic is actually your local resolver. It's not the compromised system. Further, that internal system might be talking to not one resolver, not two resolvers, but maybe as many as three different resolvers. So that traffic's coming from three different IP addresses. So we need to collapse all that down to properly identify it as C2 over DNS. So we can't give you a source IP when we're talking C2 over DNS because it could be the source IP or it could be somebody behind that. It really depends on where your sensor is installed. If the sensor is on the perimeter, what you're looking at is the resolver. It's the DNS server. It's not what's infected. But if I have Zeek running, let's say, before my resolver, well, now it'll actually see the real IP of the client, and it is actually that. But <clears throat> we can't know how you deployed Zeek, so you need to kind of think about that as you go through. So this is telling us that <clears throat> I've got 2,074 connections or excuse me, I looked up 2,074 resources within honestimnotevil.com. Okay, honestimnotevil.com, that isn't a domain I'm familiar with. So I would expect there to be 10 or less. There's 2,000, that's way too many. This is something I need to go in and pay attention to. The other thing that kind of strikes me is I have one system that's doing DNS queries for that domain, but nothing's connected to it at all that's a problem, right? Because we said when people look up resource records, they then go access that resource. That's not what's going on here. So yeah, we've got something tunneling C2 over DNS here. This is something we need to go in and kind of pay attention to. Now, there was a question, which was, <clears throat> is only text records used? So I want to show you something here. <clears throat> Um, this is the type of record being used. <clears throat> Notice text, CNAME, MX. They're not all text records. Some of them are actually CNAMEs and MXs that are mixed in here as well. In fact, there's about an equal number of each being used. So I have seen folks say, oh, I'm going to look for a lot of text record queries. And if I see it, that might be C2 over DNS. And you're right, it might, but it might not be. And you may completely miss it with that signature because they could use choose to just use C names or they could choose to just use MX records. Uh, I used all three in the C2 only because I wanted to try and get an equal number of each to so, show that anything's a possibility. I think the most creative one I've seen is DKIM entries. Uh, that one I found kind of interesting because DKIM is something we created to make DNS more secure. And folks have figured out how to make DNS less secure by running C2 through it, through those uh, through that information bundle. Go figure. <clears throat> you got to admit, sometimes attackers can be creative. All right. So that one was pretty straightforward. 
because the only thing we had was the C2 over DNS. Uh, and like we said, we don't know for certain what the source IP address is. So we would need to kind of run this down. So what would I do? What I would do is I would go to my DNS server. I would download a copy of ngrep and I would say, hey, ngrep, monitor port UDP 53 and look for the character string honestimnotevil.com. And I'll see two things. I'll see the query come in from the client and then I'll see the resolver sending a query out to the internet. But now I'm seeing the IP address of the client. I could probably even do a more of a filter and say, hey, UDP 53, but the destination IP has to be that of the DNS resolver. And now everything I see is going to be that client making its queries. That's how I would figure out what the client IP address is. Okay. Oh, yeah, I didn't show you this. That's what, see, this is why I double check on the slide. So this is showing a thousand entries or more. If I take my threshold and just drop that down to zero, this is going to start showing me all of my unique queries that took place. Hmm. That looks interesting, doesn't it? Does that look like something you would name one of your systems? Probably not. That looks like hex to me. And if I was really creative, which we get it, we get creative when we get into the advanced threat hunting class, you could take that hex, convert it to ASCII, and figure out what actually is running across this command and control channel because they didn't encrypt anything. They simply obfuscated it by turning it into hex instead. All right. Did I miss anything else? Yeah, it looks like DNS cat too. And I know that just because it's hex and DNS cat two uses hex. All right, got one more lab set for you to go through and use. So here's what we're gonna do. Please follow along. Although this is in the slides too. So we gotta go to the lab three directory. So I'm gonna say cd dot dot forward slash lab three. So now I am in the lab three directory. Now I need to import this data. So I'm going to say Rita import star.log and we'll name this one lab three. So let me, uh, let me copy some commands here and I'll throw these into discord as well. Just so everybody's got them. So the first command is what gets you into the lab three directory. The second command is what takes that Zeek data and imports that into, a, into ACE. So I'm gonna go through, I'm gonna run this command. Password is hunting, if it prompts you for that. And here I am going through importing the data. It found 88 different hosts, no proxy data again this time, 107 DNS records. We got 31 SNI records. Uh, what else? We got some user agent strings in here. We had some invalid certs to look at. Oh, we had a little bit of everything going on, didn't we? So let me go through, pull that aside. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my dashboard. I'm going to go to settings, the little gear icon in the top right. I'm going to go to databases, which it should open by default. And notice I got a lab three data set now. I'm going to open that up. And now what I want you to do is hunt it. So we only got one IP in here. So there's only one that you need to focus on. Where are these threat points coming from? Which ones do I need to worry about? Which ones look like they're okay? Uh, let's see, I see. Uh, I guess DNS cat two that was being referred to as the tool used for DNS tunneling, yes. So DNS cat two is the command and control tool that was being used to tunnel the command and control traffic over DNS. Uh, you can grab that off of uh, GitHub. There's a couple of different variations off of there that'll roll stuff off of uh, DNS. That was the one I chose for doing in the labs. All right. So once you get here, do some hunting. I'm going to give you a little bit to go through this, and then we'll talk about this one.
Okay, we're getting close to the end of the class. So I wanna make sure we cover this. And it looks like a couple of people have already kind of gone down the rabbit hole and figured out what's going on here. So let me kind of go through these and kind of cover what we got. So if I go under long connections, the two that are in here, same as the two we saw in the first lap. So same description goes here. The second one is Microsoft related. So this one's probably okay. The first one is going to active countermeasures. So if they're a business partner, this one might be okay too. We'd need to do a little bit more research on that. If I go back to Beacon Webs, if I look at my first entry, I've got 3,188 connections. The destination is noob02skypetm.com.ty. Does that sound like a legitimate Skype URL to you? Not to me, right? Maybe skype.com.ty or TW. That might be legitimate, but not Skype TM. This looks like somebody registered a domain to try and get as close to Skype as they possibly could. With, you know, but they can't use Skype because somebody's already taken that. It's not uncommon to see like domains uh, that show up with ones for L's or zeros for O's because the uh, legitimate user of that domain didn't think to register those two. So that's what I think is going on here. I look at that domain and that immediately strikes me as spammy, is, is, is something evil. So the, that domain is kind of just grabbing me. The other thing that gets me, look at the host parameter. It's an IP address. We said that's supposed to be a fully qualified domain name. That's kind of weird. Look at the user agent string, Microsoft Internet Explorer. That's not how Microsoft Internet Explorer identifies itself. It identifies itself as IE space and the version number. And that's not what we're seeing here. There's something else going on. So that's a bogus user agent string. TCP 80 traffic, look at this. Remember we talked about what jitter looks like, specifically when somebody is using CrowdStrike to generate jitter? It looks like a bell curve. What does this look like to you? Oh, hey, Chris, that kind of looks like a bell curve. Yeah, it does. But look at my bottom chart. <clears throat> this is going off about 130 times each hour. So this is going off roughly a little bit more frequently than twice per minute. Yeah, this is definitely a beacon. This is something worth going in and paying attention to. Has it been activated? Well, this looks like a heartbeat. This looks like our, hey, do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. Do you have anything for me to do? No, go back to sleep. And there's a couple of points here where it looks like it might have been activated, but there's not much data movement. If I look at the biggest, it's 828 bytes. That's yeah, not much. So they've maybe poked and prodded a little bit, but they haven't actually grabbed any file information off of here yet. <clears throat> so this one, I'm highly suspect. If we go to the next one, uh, self.events.data.microsoft.com. Okay, that looks like it's uh, Microsoft Calendar. We're probably like an office type of thing. So if I want to go in and safe list that, I would go in and do that safe list based on events.data.microsoft.com. We talked about you don't want a wild card safe list everything at Microsoft because things may sneak through that you didn't intend. So if I can go to a subdomain, I'm going to be in slightly better shape. Once I safe list that, my next entry is msn.com. Okay, that's you know Microsoft doing their thing again. And then this last one, settings-win.data.microsoft.com. Okay, that looks like it's a Microsoft thing as well. So it looks like I got one beacon to worry about. I didn't see any long connections I needed to be concerned about. Uh, there isn't anything in DNS that we need to be worried about. But look here, Microsoft.com was the biggest domain we were querying. What's this? This is reverse lookups. This is somebody saying, hey, instead of uh, giving you the fully qualified domain name and getting back an IP, I want to give you the IP so you can give me back the fully qualified domain name. That's what those queries are. But there's nothing in here that looks overly suspicious either. So the only one we really have is this one here. So if I go in and I take a look at my http.log file, let's see what we have in here that looks kind of interesting. 
So is my source IP destination IP, source port, destination port. Here is that host parameter that we looked at, right? Now, this is kind of weird because if I say grep Skype in dns.log file, I get back Skype within a cloud app. I get a bunch of those. I don't, if I look through this data, I don't actually have Skype TM. That was never looked up. Let's just kind of double check that because the website was at this IP address. So let's go in and say, grep that IP address out of dns.log file. Nope, no hits on that. So they didn't get there via DNS. That's kind of odd. This UR, this host string, we said, this does not look like something that would be legitimate used by Skype. This part here, that screams warning Will Robinson to me. If I look at the URI, we've got a really long URI string again taking place. That looks highly suspicious. We said this user agent string, that's not legitimate. Somebody's forging that. 200, okay. Yeah, this is another one that looks like a command and control channel. So how would I run this down? Well, you could search on this, but that may not give us the answer we need because it's a very short string and it's probably going to pattern match on a bunch of stuff. If it was me, I would Google that. Specifically, I would Google that and see what comes up just to try and find out what's going on. If I'm in AC Hunter, I can go in and I can say, hey, um, let's see, security trail, uh, virus total should have some good stuff. I like using virus total. Six security vendors flag this domain as malicious. This is a malicious domain. And when you get down into the data, yeah, there's a lot of data here to tell you this is something you need to worry about. So again, we had one to worry about, and that was it. But it wasn't that hard to go through and find it, which is kind of cool. Let's see, did I miss anything? We talked about the domain looks scammy. We talked about Internet Explorer is wrong. The histogram, we talked about that. Yeah, this looks like that cobalt strike bell curve we talked about, and it's consistently all day long. That's definitely a beacon. You know, it comes back as being, yeah, this is something to be concerned about. Um, we've got enough evidence to say, yeah, this is, no, we need to go in and in response mode. This system is definitely compromised. So the next thing I might do is I might say, okay, let me go in and let me go into, um, um, hmm, why isn't it here? Oh, I was trying to get into, ah, because I got to do it based on IP address. Go into deep dive. Is anybody else talking to that IP address or is it just this one system? Do I have one internal compromised system talking to the C2 server or do I potentially have multiple? That would be one of the next things I'd want to run down. And then from there, we'd want to go into incident response mode. We'd want to find out what binary is running on this system that's causing this connection to go through and take place. Now, one of the connections that showed up in there, I mean, look at this one, uh, but it's going to OpenDNS. OpenDNS is owned by Cisco. They have a threat hunting service <laughs> that is basically you send them your DNS queries and they'll tell you if your DNS queries is going someplace that's known to be malicious. Okay, that's not very helpful because we told you the threat model's changed. It's not about mass propagation anymore. That really isn't going to tell me much. But what you will see is a ton of DNS queries all going out to open DNS all the time. So that end up that may end up getting flagged as C2 over DNS potentially. Um, let's see. How did I see that? I pulled that in off of the wrong data set. I may have pulled that in off of the wrong data set. Oh no, here it is. It's second, second line entry here. So yeah, these are going out. It was only 77 connections. So it wasn't enough to trigger the C2 over DNS module but it was frequent enough to get pulled into the beacon module. What you'll notice is that really busy C2 over DNS is gonna trigger both modules. We're gonna say it looks like a beacon and it looks like C2 over DNS. This stayed low and slow enough that it didn't trigger as a DNS beacon or as, as C2 over DNS, but we still went in and flagged this as a beacon. 
And this is, like we said, it's just a lookup service to tell you if your users are trying to go someplace evil. Not very useful in my estimation. Long connections, those are the same as we saw before. And like I said, if you want to keep practicing, there's that Z command that I threw into the Discord channel a bunch of times. You can go check out malware of the day, pull down the PCAP, pull it in with Zeek. Bill shared an import script a couple of times. Um, don't Please don't use that import script. That import script actually corrupts the data. Uh, it'll look like it worked. It didn't. And you're going to get incorrect results. So for, we, that's something we need to fix in this version. So for now, simply take your PCAP, run Zeek against it offline, and then take the... Um, PCAP files and pull them up. If you're running Zeek and having it automatically feed in log files, you don't need to worry about this. It's just if you already have a PCAP you want to analyze, process it with Zeek, bring the log files over, not the PCAP over. And quite honestly, that'll be more efficient anyway. The Zeek logs are much smaller than the PCAPs. Um, so again, this process, identify connection persistency. See if you can recognize a business need associated with that persistency. If we can, it's okay to safe list it. If not, we need to dig a little bit deeper. Is there anything weird in the protocol? You know, the user agent string is Internet Explorer. No, that's wrong. <laughs> it's not a legitimate user agent string. Is there something weird in the protocol itself? Can't, what can we find out about that external IP? Do we have any logs associated with the internal system like Beaker? that'll tell us what apps are creating what connections. That may help us go through and run this down. I mentioned this back in the beginning. Uh, the Prompt Magazine is coming out next month. Uh, so check out this link, sign up to get notified when it comes out. Uh, it's gonna be focused on threat hunting. It should be really cool. We've got a CTF in that that should be a lot of fun. Besides Charm is coming up. If you liked this content and you wanna go even deeper, I'm going to be teaching the advanced version of this class that goes a lot deeper at, uh, besides Trump. You can show up and attend it live or you can take it online. Either one of those is going to be an option. Sign up for that is the second link that you see down here. Um, this is not in your deck because I'm not a salesperson. So I didn't think of this when I created the deck. I was reminded to do this during one of the breaks. Um, if you like what you say and you want to upgrade to the full enterprise version, um, in the chat for Zoom, not the chat for Discord, because that tends to get buried with everybody else typing. But if you throw it in the chat for Zoom, type in the word demo, and we'll reach out to you and we'll work on getting demo together. Um, there's a lot of additional features, like you can keep track of multiple uh, data sets. Uh, you can keep a history of the data that you've seen. We said, you know, the uh, ACE version is limited to 24 hours. The enterprise will go way back. The uh, ACE version is limited to like 50 safe lists. The enterprise is unlimited. The enterprise version also has alerting built into it. It's got some really good features. So if you want to check that out, like I said, in the Zoom chat, just type in demo. We'll reach out to you and we'll take care of uh, setting up some time to chat with you. Um, heads up, we are doing a price increase. Uh, we're looking at probably doubling the price of the product. So right now it's about uh, 9K the first year, 4K a year after that. Anybody who we hear from and gets a price quote between now and the end of the month, we'll lock that in for 90 days. After that, the price is going to go up to about 20K. Um, we've added in enough features that we feel like it's more than worth it. And we want to be able to bring in some more staff to be able to kind of ease things up a little bit on the folks that are here. So we are looking at a price increase by the end of the month, just so folks know. Um, with that said, thank you for attending. You know, Jason mentioned this at the very beginning, and I want to make sure we mention it again. Um, your time is valuable. You could have chosen to do anything with this, with the six hours of your life, and you chose it to spend with us, and that really means a lot. So thank you to everybody who turned out. We really appreciate it. Uh, any additional questions or comments, throw them in the Discord channel. We will keep an eye on that. And with that said, hey, we are done. Does anybody want to jump in and have anything else they want to add in? Yeah, I just wanted to jump in real quick. And, um, you know, obviously we get asked this a bunch of times. So just so everybody is clear, uh, yes, this was recorded. We're going to be uploading the recording to the same page where you downloaded the labs from. That should be up within the next week or so. 
and, and we you, will knit together the two versions of it because uh, the Zoom session dropped about 50 minutes in, 45 yes. minutes in. So we'll knit those together when we post it. Yes, it'll be one video. And I usually edit out the like 10 minute breaks that we do too, so that it's, you know, not a bunch of dead air. But um, that will be up within a week or so after we're done with the editing. And then you will receive a certificate if you are attending live through the Zoom. Um, that will be sent within the next two hours. Please give it till the end of the day. Um, if you uh, don't receive your certificate by... Give it till tomorrow. Yeah, if, if you don't receive your <laughs> certificate by the end of tomorrow, um, feel free to reach out to me. But um, like we mentioned, please give it at least the uh, 24 hours to receive your certificate via email. It'll be sent from uh, Gutenberg certs, and we do recommend you check all your folders, including promo and junk and stuff like that. Yeah, because, because, and I hate to say it, but I can guarantee within an hour, Shelby's going to have people nagging her with my cert. <laughs> yes. And <laughs> even though she said, please give it 24 hours, it takes a little bit. Within an hour, we're going to be getting emails. <laughs> right. And as much as I, uh, I love everyone and I want to be helpful, I will not respond to those emails until it's been at least 24, 24 hours. hours so. Yeah. Good idea. <laughs> and Liquid's already asking for theirs. Yeah. yeah. This is the one in every crowd. <laughs> <laughs> and Skynet. Yep. Oh, look what we started. Okay. All right. Anything else, Shelb? Uh, nope. Just those two reminders. And as Chris said, thank you everybody for joining us so much. If you liked this training, uh, feel free to share it with your friends. We've mentioned a few times we're doing another session in April. So we appreciate when uh, you help us spread the knowledge. Yeah. Uh, hopefully thank you so much, everybody. Yes. Have yeah, a great rest thanks. of your day. Thanks, thanks yeah, everybody. Thank you, folks. Enjoy your day. Bye. Bye.